Dr. George Jalo um, uh, uh, is at uh, he's a consultant neurosurgeon at the Old Children's Hospital, uh, George Hopkins Old Children's Hospital in Central oh, no, no, no. Florida. Oh, Elias, oh, no. are, you are you here, Elias? Oh, no. Uh, and uh, he's the uh, uh, physician in chief at the uh, John Hopkins Old Children's Hospital, and he's a doyen of pediatric neurosurgery. So he's going to talk to us about um, the uh, how to manage hydrocephalus in posterior fossa tumors in pediatrics. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jalo. Uh, thanks, Naren, and good morning, good afternoon. Um, Happy New Year to all. Hey, um, it's great to uh, present here at this uh, last uh, webinar of the year. Um, Naren, can I get uh, sh screen sharing sure. Sorry. access? Okay, great. perfect. I think you can, hopefully you can see the presentation now. Yes, we can, thanks. Wonderful, uh, great. So um, again, just it's a pleasure uh, to be to join you on the webinar uh, today, um, the la you know, as we end the year and start our new year, uh, 2024. What I want to talk about is really the management of hydrocephalus associated with uh, posterior fossa tumors, mainly in children. Um, and the reason I, I want to present this is this was the interesting case um, that presented to our hospital um, several weeks ago. I think it was like the first weekend or second weekend of December. Uh, this was a five-year-old girl uh, who's otherwise healthy, no previous uh, medical history, oh, oh, oh. aside from aside from not uh, no oh. vaccinations or immunizations. Um, who presented with several weeks of uh, morning uh, headaches with uh, emesis um, and some gait instability. The family, uh, um, uh, because they, they really did not seek much medical care uh, and did not have a local pediatrician, uh, they just uh, presented to the uh, emergency room on a Saturday evening. On examination in the emergency room, she had a, um, uh, she, she was essentially awake, uh, really no focal deficits aside from a left six nerve palsy and some uh, mild uh, papilledema on uh, fundoscopic examination. Um, she was a little unsteady in her gait, but uh, you know it was hard to say given uh, the time or the uh, of her presentation. Um, and and here's the CAT scan, uh, the non-contrast uh, CAT scan uh, in the emergency room, and you can see this young girl has um, the hydrocephalus, transpendymal edema. Um, that's associated with the hydrocephalus that's secondary to a fourth ventricular, uh, a rel relatively large uh, posterior fossa or fourth uh, ventricular tumor. Um, and, you know, as as you would expect is, you know, differentials, um, uh, you know, whether it's a medulloblastoma, a pilocytic eschatoma, or an ependymoma. And the question is, you know, what would one do uh, when she presents um, uh, into your hospital setting on a Saturday evening? Um, would you obtain a CT scan with contrast, uh, MRI, or other studies? And then um, uh, in terms of the management, uh, surgical, uh, would you? when would you address the tumor? Would it be a biopsy, a resection? And how would you treat the uh, obstructive hydrocephalus associated with this tumor? Would one consider a CSF diversion? Um, and with that, would it be a, an EVD, an ETV, uh, a VP shunt, or nothing? And uh, before I you know, uh, discuss how we managed it, I'd love to get the, the group's thoughts on uh, what uh, one would do uh, for this uh, young girl. Any and who would, um, would you just take her to the operating room, take out the tumor, um, or would you treat the, the hydrocephalus? I think you're on mute, Magnum. Uh, I think we're still on mute. I'm mute. Sorry. I'm muting again. Okay, sorry. There you go. Uh, if I... If I may say, I would do an MRI first. Okay. Absolutely. And would you do the, um, if you got the MRI, um, 
uh, and it showed, you know, that that tumor, no other uh, neuroaxis dissemination, and just the uh, the hydrocephalus. How would you uh, would you just take her to the operating room? Uh, uh, yeah, you mean what do what do we see in the uh, in the MRI? Is that a yes. uh, uh, circumscribed tumor or yes? Okay, yes. Uh, we probably would go. It depends a little bit on. Uh, what day who is in the hospital probably would go immediately in the OR we take the tumor out if we have some problem we would do a EV uh, uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy first and just to win some time and uh, to do it maybe the day later or some days later okay thank you George I would say that as serendipity have it today just this morning we have a child at three years nine months with the same size tumor with the same story is undergoing an MRI of brain and spine and then we will probably if the time permits we'll probably go in and take the tumor out with the proviso of putting an external drain if there's too tight otherwise we'll take the tumor out and not uh, see what happens to the hydrocephalus absolutely no, I think they're both very reasonable. I will say, um, you know, uh, it was a Saturday evening that she came in. Um, I get nervous on the weekends, if, if, especially if we're not going to address uh, uh, the tumor immediately, uh, given the uh, degree of hydrocephalus. Um, I elected to place uh, the to do a uh, EVD, an external ventriculostomy drain, uh, and then straight from the operating room, then take her to MRI. Um, to get the studies, because I always worry, you know, I sometimes worry uh, for these children that uh, when they're under anesthesia and they're getting a long uh, MRI, that they're really unmonitored and their hydrocephalus is not controlled, especially when, you know, um, they're symptomatic with uh, raised ICP given her six nerve palsy. Um, so uh, what we, what I ended up doing was uh, uh, placing the, uh, EVD and then bringing her down for the MRI and you can see uh, the, the tumor there um, and you can see the immediate resolution of the uh, uh, the ventricular size with that external ventricular drain. Um, and once this was, uh, once we had this in place, um, you know, essentially um, she was placed on the floor um, and then brought to the operating room electively during the week. Uh, uh, so she was brought to operating room on a Monday or Tuesday, I think, of that week uh, for surgery. Um, and then, you know, uh, it did turn out to be, it was a suboccipital craniotomy, uh, turned, about to be, turned out to be a medulloblastoma. Uh, we left the EVD in for about uh, three to four days to help manage uh, uh, the drainage uh, of, of the, 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 the cerebral spinal fluid. And then uh, we removed the drain and uh, she's done well without the need for a, uh, a shunt uh, or evidence of a CSF leak or pseudomeningus seal. So I think, you know, in terms of it, I think, you know, we all recognize that brain tumors are the most common solid neoplasm in children um, and that they account for about 40 to 60% of all tumors. And as I said, the differential was there. Um, and in, in terms of hydrocephalus, the preoperative incidence in children is somewhere between the 70 to 85%, depending upon the literature that you read. Um, and it really is, you know, is it radiographic or is it clinical hydrocephalus? Uh, um, that, you know, I think that's, uh, th there's a distinction between having large ventricles uh, uh, versus having large ventricles with uh, evidence of raised ICP. And the literature supports that about uh, the, the, Postoperative incidence of hydrocephalus following the tumor section um, is still doesn't even with the resection of the tumor doesn't go down to zero. It's still about twenty to twenty five percent of children uh, may uh, continue to have hydrocephalus uh, following the resection of the tumor. And I think you know when you look at these, uh, you know the presentation is classic, as in this young girl had with the uh, nausea, vomiting, the headaches, the abnormal gait in the papilledema, um, as well as the abnormal um, eye movements. I think the only thing that she did not have uh, was the, the lethargy um, uh, as evident in her presentation. So classic, pres typical presentation for your posterior fossa tumors. And same thing if you've got a brainstem tumor uh, as well, where is, you know, there, the incidence of true clinical raised ICP is really small on the order of 10%. So what are the 
what are the management options for hydrocephalus associated with the posterior fossa tumor? I think one, um, you know, that you could place an extra fecal CSF shunt, an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, an external ventriculostomy drain. Um, there's, I, I have not seen this done, but uh, in the literature, uh, there's been reports of an external CSF reservoir or a ventricular access device. Um, and then do nothing, don't just address the tumor. Um, and that should treat the uh, the associated hydrocephalus. Um, and when one treats a tumor, you know, I think it's really dependent upon your practice whether some people would put an EVD uh, at the time of surgery versus uh, no EVD in just addressing the tumors. So I think you know, let me just talk about you know what are the advantages of uh, of um, of um, of uh, a VP shunt. I think some of the advantages. Are improvement. Um, there's been reports of a smoother postoperative recovery, uh, including decreased mortality. Some of the old literature states that patients that were shunted before the tumor, uh, their mortality was um, uh, decreased uh, by about uh, three to four fold. Uh, and there's definitely a decreased rate of CSF leak uh, and a pseudomeningocele uh, uh, formation. But it's also got its disadvantages, you know, aside from just addressing the tumor, you've got a lifetime commitment to the CSF diversion uh, and its associated complications as well as malfunctions. Um, and then, you know, there's the reported uh, uh, case reports of an intratumoral hemorrhage or upward her her herniation uh, when you've got an acute um, uh, decrease of the raised intracranial pressure uh, with with the placement of the of the VP shunt. So you know it is not uh, foolproof. Uh, the other question is, what is the role of external ventriculostomy catheters uh, in in the management of posterior fossa tumors? And this was a paper that just recently published uh, two years ago uh, in, neuro, in in Neurosurgical Review that really looked at the uh, prophylactic. Uh, uh, use of EVDs. And, and I think, you know, this review shared that there's really no consensus uh, concerning prophylactic EVD placement uh, that is used for posterior fossa tumors. Um, and that, you know, again, as I had stated earlier, um, one does see the hydrocephalus more common in children uh, than adults, and that it, it may persist, uh, more likely to persist in children uh, than in adults. And what they found was that, you know, some of the predictive factors for postoperative hydrocephalus were the young age, children less than three, uh, severe hydrocephalus, uh, the placement of an EVD uh, preoperatively, you know, it, which may be counterintuitive, um, uh, suggests that they're more likely to need uh, permanent CSF uh, diversion, um, and that you know uh, clearly that the, the you know the pre resection uh, placement of a CSF diversion um, is is mandatory for those children that present in extremis or clearly symptomatic. Uh, from their hydrocephalus. So the advantages are, I think, you know, it's a life-saving for elevated intracranial pressure. It's, it can easily control the CSF diversion and tr uh, try to, you know, prevent the small risk of upward herniation. It's helpful to help remove the blood and tumor debris products uh, post-resection, allows you to monitor the ICP in the post-operative period. And the goal is hopefully to avoid the placement of a VP shunt or performing an EVD. Disadvantages are the known uh, infection rate with these external ventriculostomy uh, catheters. And uh, what the literature supports is that there's a slight increased incidence of post-resection hydrocephalus um, when uh, in those patients that had an EVD uh, prior to resection. Um, the, the next is the ventricular access device. And I found very few studies on this management protocol. Um, I will admit, I've never seen it in my practice, so I'd be curious to see if anyone has comments about this. Um, uh, what they, you know, I think it, what, what they do say is that um, it's, it allows for the access of CSF um, and prevents the placement of a shunt um, and limits uh, or decreases the, uh, the infection rate uh, in these children, but very limited uh, data with that. Um, and finally, you know, I think let's, you know, the endoscopic third ventriculostomy that some would really advocate. Um, and we've, uh, and essentially we've done this uh, uh, at all children's as well. You do get control of the ICP, you avoid the catheter related complications. It allows for the elective tumor uh, resection um, and can reduce the incidence of pseudomeningoceles and CSF leak. 
Um, what disadvantages are, honestly, is that, you know, it, that the, this diversion is probably not needed in up to 70% of the children uh, following the, the resection and total removal of the tumor. Uh, it is not complication free with the complication rate of uh, close to 9% and that there's a risk of the stoma closure following the tumor uh, resection, uh, given the blood and the debris products that may block uh, the third ventriculostomy. Um, and I think, you know, this paper, again, uh, that was just pu that was published in Child's Nervous System, looked at endoscopic third ventriculostomy uh, prior to the resection of posterior fossa tumors. Um, and what they did was they they, they looked at a, their series of about uh, of children uh, uh, at their center for uh, over an 11 year period. They had 36 uh, uh, patients in the control group and 38 uh, in, in their study group. And they looked at all the variables um, and that the, the, the rate of uh, a post-operative VP shunt placement was 31% in the control group, whereas the ones that underwent the pre-operative, the pre-tumor resection ATV, uh, their their uh, their their hydrous, their uh, play, need for a VP shunt was uh, dramatically decreased or cut in half to about 16%. Um, and what they said was that it does decrease the rate of post-operative VP shunt placement, and that it's relatively safe, and it really should be considered. Uh, in these patients. Um, how, uh, the other study uh, from Salt Lake City looking at endoscopic third ventriculostomy um, for pediatric tumor-associated hydrocephalus, and this was really uh, a, a meta-analysis that looked at uh, all, all studies uh, that, were, that were published after uh, the year 2000, and th that they were, they were able to find uh, 32 studies uh, from you know the literature uh, survey of close to 200 papers, um, and what they found in all these uh, tumors was that really um, that an ETV was uh, performed in about 30 percent, uh, and that the failure rate uh, for uh, these ETVs was anywhere from about six percent to 40 percent, um, uh, and uh, and that. Altogether, the, you could say that the failure rate is about 20%, uh, and that really there were very few studies that compared ETV versus a VP shunt uh, for tumor-associated uh, hydrocephalus. Um, and what they found was that it is warranted for select pediatric population. However, the failure rate is very similar to those of a VP shunt uh, when associated with hydrocephalus. So I think, you know, the other question comes up is, what are the risk factors for post-resection hydrocephalus? Um, and this paper that was, uh, you know, m probably uh, close to 20 years old, really looked at, uh, from Seattle, um, looking at uh, a little over 100 pa uh, patients. Um, and what they found was that, uh, that really uh, some of the uh, factors that uh, uh, predisposed to development of um, of post uh, resection hydrocephalus or persistent post resection hydrocephalus was you know one a sub two total resection of the tumor the young age uh, the prolonged use of an external ventricular drain uh, the pseudomeningocele formation uh, and the use of uh, of cadaveric uh, dural grafts or uh, a foreign body dural substitute, which may have led to some inflammatory uh, response in CSF. So really, I think, you know, with, with, with uh, you know, their, 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 their inkling was that um, the, the younger age and the prolonged use of EVDs was more likely to lead, lead to hydrocephalus. Now, uh, I think, you know, we, we have to talk about the, the modified Canadian preoperative prediction rule uh, in children, and then the Frankfurt grading system uh, for adults in posterior fossil tumors. And this was uh, a scale that, you know, from zero to 10, both of them, uh, looking uh, at uh, the development of um, uh, the risk factors in the development of post resection hydrocephalus. If, uh, you know, looking at those predictors where the age, the presence of transependymal edema, um, uh, whether they're not uh, metastases, uh, the, uh, the, the diagnosis of the tumor uh, and the location. And uh, in terms of score, uh, 0 to 10, 0 to 4 is a low risk of developing post resection hydrocephalus, whereas if you scored above 5, uh, there was a higher risk uh, or a higher need 
uh, for the development of hydrocephalus. And in this recent paper, uh, just published just published this month, actually, um, you know, they really looked at 116 children, um, and what they found was that. Uh, the the Canadian the modified Canadian preoperative prediction uh, score is was predictive of the development of hydrocephalus, yeah. and that was originally developed by uh, the Salt Lake uh, the group uh, of uh, uh, from Salt Lake so City. And then uh, finally, I think you know when we look at metastatic uh, tumors of the posterior fossa, um, and there's really very small number of literature looking at. Uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy versus a VP shunt um, in in this uh, small population, um, and what they found was that the ETV failure rate will go up if there is a disseminated uh, in the presence of disseminated uh, tumor, um, and that this failure rate was closer to uh, uh, fifty five percent as compared to. Uh, the tumors that uh, did not have dissemination. Um, and this group really advocated uh, avoiding the uh, ETV uh, uh, and rather just placing a shunt in those patients that had disseminated tumors and hydrocephalus uh, for several reasons. One was uh, it, given the high failure rate, it would prolong or delay the need for uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy, um, as well as uh, the uh, associated complication profile uh, when there is a disseminated tumor. And I think really just to conclude um, uh, my talk, I think this is a recent paper um, uh, by uh, uh, out of India in uh, published in Neurology India that really looked at posterior fossa, uh, posterior fossa tumors and hydrocephalus how to manage uh, effectively. Um, and I'm just going to leave it there uh, because I think this was an excellent uh, paper, review paper, uh, looking at the management and the discussion of really everything that I shared uh, with you uh, today. And again, Naren, I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak about hydrocephalus that's associated with posterior fossa uh, tumors. Any questions for me? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jalo. That's a fantastic talk, looking at all the subtle, subtle and multiple uh, points where hydrocephalus can form, or CSF problems can form in these patients, and also the various options and not clear um, data, which is better. Um, Mr. Uh, Magnum, uh, uh, do you have any comments or any questions for Dr. Jal? Um, I absolutely agree with all the points he, he shared with us. It, it is it is something we all worry that if you do a scan when someone who is acutely unwell and it is unmonitored, so how much damage you're causing doing an MRI. And there are and there are other factors also that you you have logistical factors that doing an operation on the weekend, you don't have exactly the same amount of expertise around you. And sometimes it is also the important factor nowadays is the genetics for the tumors. So if you don't have an active frozen section or neuropathology available to do those things, um, it, is, it is something which you have to take on the balance that you might have to wait till the working day to do that. And there is no harm in doing a diversion procedure in the meanwhile. So I think the way the oncological treatment is progressing towards genetic and molecular-based treatment, I think probably we, especially I'm talking about UK experience, we might see that more children do have some diversion procedures over the weekend, waiting for the pathology to be available unless there's 24-7 Neuropathology services, which unfortunately is not available everywhere. Great. Thank you. Um, George, any comeback? Any, any any observation in the comments? No, you know, I agree. I think, you know, as as Magdalene, as Magdalene, uh, elicited, I mean, I think the goal is to take out the tumor. Um, but, you know, it, it really depends upon uh, the individual child and their presentation, um, uh, as well as the time of day. You know, on the weekends, um, I am less like I am less willing to do a, uh, a tumor, a posterior fossa tumor reception on the weekend yeah. if I can stabilize and do it during the week when Absolutely. we have all the resources available to us. Now, I know some centers may be different, but um, um, 
I, I would rather just uh, wait to do it during the week um, and just control, manage the hydrocephalus uh, uh, with, you know, a CSF diversion, whether it be an ETV or uh, an ETV. Thanks. Simon, Dr. Alibaba, do you have, what's your practice? And uh, do you have any comments, questions for Dr. Jalo and any experience from your side? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, George. Uh, great lecture as always. And uh, I agree with all the observations and comments from Professor Jallo. In our practice, we typically have uh, similar management for the hydrocephalus if they are clinically stable uh, uh, and without any concerns for intracranial hypertension. We go, like the case he showed earlier, we go for MRI and take for resection at the earliest possible uh, day with the best logistics. The only change in my practice I did over the last 10 or 15 years is that I have a couple of complications with uh, patients who have preoperative frontal EVD, who after we did a posterior fossa resection in prone position, uh, they both had epidural hematomas frontally. And uh, nothing unusual about those cases, except both of them had GPAs. So both of them had hydrocephalus building over uh, a long time compared to higher grade uh, tumors. So in my practice now, when I, uh, if the patients are stable and they have severe hydrocephalus radiographically more than clinically, when I take them to the operating room and position, position them in prone position, I place a parieto occipital uh, external ventricular drain, drain a little bit, keep it clamped for the rest of the case, drain it as needed for any intraoperative edema and drain it post-op for typically three days. Uh, one change I did in my practice, I used to do a slow wean for the EVD over uh, five days. Uh, nowadays, I, if there are not many blood products from the surgery, I would do uh, a quick wean over three days. And after three days over a quick wean, if the patient neurologic uh, uh, symptoms wise showing signs of hydrocephalus or not tolerating the the, the quick wean and MRI showing the ventricle still in the larger side, we go for an early ETV as early as three to five days postoperatively. And the success rate is over 90%. Uh, you may argue that some of them probably may avoid the ETV, but we found the morbidity from the ETV is close to 0%. And uh, we are able to get those kids quicker out of the ICU and into rehabilitation as needed. And some of them, if they have blastomas or ependymomas, will go quicker into adjuvant therapy and get potentially get them home before they get readmitted for the adjuvant therapy. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Sama. In terms of the ETVs, um, you know, the floor of these patients, the ones that I have been involved with, are, they are quite thick. You don't quite see through the floor and there's also a nice paper from Jahuda and uh, I can't remember the second author from, I think, uh, Rafael uh, Guzman, that about two or three percent of the patients in the flow of the third ventricle, they are a nuclei. And um, do you find uh, um, and it's good that you, you, you haven't had any morbidity from ETV, but I'm always a bit concerned that I don't see the other end of the uh, ETV and the, whether the, you know, the when the floor is thick, whether there's injury to nuclei. Any thoughts on that? Thanks. Uh, I personally have not had this observation. Typically, when I go with the EVD uh, to do the ETV in a patient who had a recent posterior fossa tumor resection, typically as soon as I enter the third ventricle, almost always you'll see uh, a, th a thin film of blood or a couple of clots. And I'll try to irrigate or aspirate them and before doing the ETV. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Dr. You. Keller, uh, do you have any questions, comments uh, to Dr. Jalla? Uh, yes, I I, uh, uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I was a little bit surprised that uh, the problems with the uh, VP shunts are less than with the ETVs, because especially if you have blood, if you have high protein levels, uh, I would expect that the uh, uh, that you will get also problems with the VP shunts, and may, may can you comment this yeah. shortly? You know, I, I was I 
I thought this, I had the same thought process. I thought that an ETV uh, would have a less complication profile than a VP shunt. Uh, but the one paper that I found was really from the oncological literature that suggested that uh, the children that had disseminated tumors, uh, a VP shunt had a lower complication profile uh, than, in, uh, than those children that had uh, an ETV. Again, it was only in one paper, um, and no other, there were no other papers that I was able to find that supported that. However, there's no other papers that refuted that, uh, their, 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 their conclusions. Uh, I, I just would like to, uh, uh, to comment, Naren, your, uh, your problem with the ETV is that sometimes it's a thick floor and you don't see through, mm -hmm. um, the advantage if you want to do uh, uh, endoscopic surgery, tricholostomy, you never should force it and uh, you still have the possibility just to put a external ventricular drain instead. Um, and so I think you are safe, uh, but of course you never should force it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I remember one case which, um, you know, after that I, I thought uh, uh, it was when I was doing the fellowship but you know it, it can be pretty thick, and then you have to hit on the back of the clivus to get through. But I think it it did feel um, probably safer to you to the ETV. Thanks for that, Prof. Keller. Uh, Elias, uh, do you have any comments, questions for Dr. Jano? Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, did you come across anything about closure or watertight closure of the posterior fossa and uh, decreased incidence of hydrocephalus? There was a while back. A paper from Duckling Fang showing that it decreased that by a third. The other, uh, you know, mention here is that, like Dr. Magnum has uh, referred to, is we're comparing apples to oranges to pomegranate to different types of tumors and different presentations. And the success of ETV or shunts or need for shunts is very variable. So it's not fair for any type of technique to say this is. Um, better or less effective because our comparison to begin with is not um, ideal. So these are my two comments. No. Oh, yes. No, thank you. Actually, uh, yes, there's um, one or two papers that actually discussed, you know, um, leaving the dura open uh, versus closing the dura. Um, there is an increased incidence of, hydro, you know, persistent hydrocephalus uh, in, in children where the dura is not closed. Um, and the same thing, the use of dural substitutes. There are some, you know, some papers that suggested uh, artificial dural substitutes um, uh, were more likely to develop, uh, you know, to lead to an inflammatory reaction in persistent hydrocephalus versus uh, pericranium and all. So, yeah, I think the technique, um, you know, is um, really uh, is critical uh, in preventing uh, the development uh, of persistent uh, uh hydrocephalus. Another yeah. comment I wanted to uh, put out there is, you know, it's always fascinating when they present, they have such a significant hydrocephalus and very minimal symptoms. But when they come back with a shunt failure, even with a yeah. slight change of the ventricle size, there's a tremendous alteration of the mental status and, you know, gives me pause of what we are trying to do or change in the physiology of the brain and what we do with shunting on a general, um, you know, statement here and what we do to the lymphatic system or other microscopic pathways that we don't understand or appreciate on regular imaging. Yeah. Just to share a bit of my, sorry, just to share a bit of my experience, means I have till for the last many years not closed the dura in a watertight fashion or anything. I, I leave the dura as big opening as I can and just put the bone flap back and close it. So uh, I have, um, I have unfortunately not had too many complications of not closing the dura uh, first time ever. Just just a proper facial and the skin closure has helped me. And I occasionally, if I have got a feeling that this child is having a tinge of hydrocephalus, that there is a tiny pseudomeningocele, I try to reduce the intracranial pressure by giving her a, giving them a dose of astrazolamide for two to three weeks postoperatively, just to kind of get over that period where there is inflammation, surgical uh, issues happening where the CSF absorption can be normal, but the production is high because of the surgical impact, the tumor impact, and the little bit of bleed. So in this, my practice, I have 
relied to quite a heavily on astazolamide to kind of get over that initial period. And then when the wound is healed, then if they develop hydrocephalus, then you can either manage it with ETV or shun, depending on which is which is the favorable option in the unit. Going back to Dr. Jallo, uh, to close the loop, if you have a child with uh, metastatic medulloblastoma and persistent hydrocephalus after tumor resection, do you advise, or from your practice, would you try ETV or you would go to a shunt? Um, you, you know, I've done both, Samer. Uh, I started out with doing, I, I thought ETV, uh, you know, was the way to go uh, to prevent dissemination of the tumor in the abdomen. Um, but my failure rate was so high um, that now I think the way to go is a VP shunt, uh, regardless um, of the protein as well as the, the amount of, um, of uh, you know, disseminated tumor in the neuroaxis. Um, with that said, I've seen one tumor disseminate in the abdomen, actually, from a shunt, VP shunt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Magnum, in terms of uh, when you leave the dura open, do you keep the head bandage for a longer time or... Oh, sorry, you're you're mute. mute. You're mute, Magnum. Sorry, I I means with my craniofacial training, it's we leave our wounds open from day one, and I tend to just on day one because of just the slight ooze, I just cover it with a plaster for day one. But I have never used a ever restricting head bandage for any of my patients. It's just uh, I I don't kind of feel that an external pressure is going to stop something which is forcing from inside. So the basis is that the CSF and the brain is pushing the pressure outside. So you can't deal with something from outside to stop something which is driving forces inside. Yeah, Ken Winston had a nice paper a while back. They reviewed their whole cohort of patients with the head wraps and uh, there was really no difference using or not using a head wrap in the incidence of wound leak or pseudomonas seals. I agree with you. I mean, as far as the keeping the dura closed or open, if you look at the adult literature with the posterior half fossa hemorrhage, I mean, they have to keep the dura open uh, to decrease the swelling, and uh, their incidence of hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus is pretty much the same. So it's it's um, again going back to what are we treating? Are they the same or not? Is it diffusely metastatic? What is happening to the microscopic pathways? Are they being obstructed or not, and with an ETV or shunt prevent hydrocephalus or not, it's all dependent on the microscopic physiology of the hydrocephalus. Uh, completely agree. It's just maybe a final comment. I, I just feel like the there are two things to look at. Either the CSF is going to get absorbed of the, the tumor is removed, is inherent whether the the whatever process CSF gets absorbed is used to absorbing that amount of CSF the way the children's tumor presents, some of them are very early presenters because they're formed in young age and they never have CSF absorption fully functioning before the tumor starts growing. So my feeling is that I don't think how you open or close the dura makes a difference. It is the inherent problem, the physiology of the tumor or the hydrocephalus, which is going to make the hydrocephalus obvious or not obvious. And I have published now about more than 100 cases of caries where I've never closed it Post-fossa dura, I always left it open with with great success rate of not having to have a CSF leak or need to have to go back in to do anything. So I have experience in large amount of opening the post-fossa in both tumors and caries, and I leave the dura open every time. Thank you, um, Andreas. Um, Andreas is from uh, from Berlin. Doctor uh, Jodiki, do you have any questions, comments? Oh, thank you. It's a great discussion. Um, maybe just one comment. Maybe um, anybody else in the audience had this experience um, treating a very young patient with a posterior fossa tumor without EVD and experiencing a post-operative visual disturbance. Um, so this is one thing I uh, encounter in my career that I will always uh, in in doubt um, argue in favor of an EVD prior to a prone position posterior fossa tumor surgery. I have had one patient who has had AVM with hydrocephalus who had significant um, visual disturbance post-op with grade three papilledema. I have managed it like an 
idiopathic intracranial hypertension and give him astrazolamide, which has controlling the visual problem and slowly getting better. So just holding your nerve and giving some time is what I have been yeah. doing. Can I bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Hakan Karabagli? He's a very senior pediatric neurosurgeon from Turkey. Dr. Hakan, do you have questions, comments? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jallo. Uh, good presentation about the posture of and hydrocephalus. Uh, I uh, wrote the uh, chat room, but uh, I can say uh, I am talking about the embryonal tumors, like a medulloblastomas. Uh, very young uh, infant uh, with hydrocephaly and uh, posterior fossa tumors. How about uh, the tap, anterior frontal tap? Uh, at first, we can do tap and then take out the tumor, and then uh, uh, we follow the uh, child, infant, and take the uh, MRI. What can you say about? the trans uh, anterior punction. I think that's, Dr. Uh, Karbaj, I think that's a great idea, you know, for the children that have an open uh, anterior fontanelle, I think, you know, in, if they are symptomatic, I think a fontanelle tap to stabilize, uh, obtain the imaging, and then do the surgery is a very reasonable approach, uh, which helps avoid the placement of, a, you know, of treating the uh, preoperative hydrocephalus. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, uh, um, George, I have got a couple of questions, George. Uh, first question is that um, in terms of if there's a pseudo meninges seal post-op and it's not going away, uh, when you put a shunt, I presume you'll put a shunt in that patient, what kind of valve would you use? Thanks. You know, a couple of things. I think, you know, I do, I, I agree with the management for pseudo meninges seals. I don't uh, place, I don't, typically do uh, a, a VP shunt or an ETV for the presence of acetaminidacil. Um, we'll try to manage it medically with uh, Dimox or acetazolamide um, and to see if that works. Um, the only times, you know, that I would uh, uh, go with a, a VP shunt uh, is really if they're symptomatic uh, from the hydrocephalus. Um, and if I'm, if I, if in those rare occasions that we've had to place a VP shunt, um, I do prefer a, a, um, a programmable uh, uh, valve, um, because I never know um, what the setting is uh, to help uh, get rid of that pseudomeningocele or treat the hydrocephalus. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the second question is that, uh, you know, when you put a EVDs, um, there have been cases of uh, tumor, tumor bleeds. Um, do you think that's uh, because of over drainage or is there anything that... Uh, that you can, uh, yeah, I, you know, I've never seen, uh, I've, I've only heard about this. Um, you know, uh, um, I will say, um, I, I, I've never seen it in children. Uh, I saw of all things I saw a, a, in an adult where the adults, one of the adult nurse surgeons put a, an EVD in a patient that had an acoustic schwannoma, a very large acoustic schwannoma with obstructive hydrocephalus uh, that she was very symptomatic from. Uh, they placed uh, the EVD and um, there was an intratumoral hemorrhage um, that was associated with it. Uh, I think it's whether it's an acute uh, uh, acute change in the intracranial pressure um, is, is my thought process is why um, we see some of the complications with it. I've also, I think I've, I've seen one adult with upward herniation that was clearly visible on imaging following, you know, an acute uh, uh, change in their uh, ICP or ventricular size. So, I you know, when I do place these EVDs in children, I tend to keep them very high up above the, uh, above the ear, uh, you know, and not, not go for, you know, 10, 10 centimeters, but more like 15 or 20, 25 centimeters above, just enough to drain the, the elevated pressure, but to try to prevent the upward herniation or the acute changes in ICP. Um, thanks, George. This is the last question. Um, I think you probably covered, you did cover it in the talk, but I just want to just to get you, if a patient comes on Saturday, um, but no headaches, um, no clinical uh, hydrocephalus in the sense that um, there's no six nerve palsy, but very large ventricles. And you are going to operate on Monday. 
would you observe the patient, give steroids and observe the patient, or would you do something about it on Saturday to be safe? No, I think that's a great question, and I uh, hopefully you know I might have perused it. If there is, if it's radiographic hydrocephalus but no clinical symptoms, uh, we would just observe in the uh, ICU and uh, uh, not place an EVD or treat the hydrocephalus. Uh, start them on some Decadron, and some of those kids we may even consider putting them on the acetazolamide uh, as well. Uh, but uh, really try to avoid any uh, CSF diversion un unless clinically indicated. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Jalo, Thank for the fantastic uh, talk and for the great discussions. I'm keen that we have discussions um, for each talk. I think that brings, uh, I think we learned a lot as much as from the talk as with the discussions. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jalo, there's a question from Dr. Al Raj here on the, on the chat box uh, about shunts and the infection, if you would be kind enough to uh, respond. I'll respond to it. Thank you so much. Much obliged. So now it gives me a pleasure to um, I invite Dr. Elias Risk. He's going to talk to us about um, ETV from infancy to uh, uh, elderly and with the evidence base. And Dr. Elias Risk is a um, consultant neurosurgeon at uh, Penn State University. And uh, it's a good friend of mine. And thank you, Dr. Risk. Looking forward to your talk. Cheers. Let's say thank you. Can you see my uh, slide deck? Yes. So thank you uh, very much, Naren, and the cohort of uh, fantastic would please, faculty. Would you please make it um, uh, as a presentation? At the moment, we are seeing the PowerPoint. Um, if you could make it as a presentation. Then... Full screen? Yeah, I think you might have two screens. Probably that's why. Yeah, full screen. That's what we're doing. Is this um, full screen? Excellent. Thank you. Cheers. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much for allowing me to present uh, an overview of endoscopic third ventriculostomy and going through, you know, the history of CSF hydrocephalus endoscopic, uh, or the third ventricular, uh, third ventricular space and understanding the technology that we have in our hands and having a somewhat of an overview of ETVs, uh, just like Dr. Jallo has done uh, in regards to hydrocephalus and posterior fossa and trying to summarize the best way the available literature and come up with some uh, semblance of a conclusion. So, you know, the summary of what we understand of ETVs, it's a technique that we use to treat communicating hydrocephalus uh, and non, sorry, non-communicating hydrocephalus and sometimes communicating hydrocephalus. It use, you know, the simplest way to explain this is to create a hole in the floor of the third ventricle to allow to the CSF to egress and circulate better uh, throughout the brain. And it falls using some form of uh, endoscopy, be it flexible or rigid flex, uh, uh, or rigid, but rigid uh, uh, scopes. Uh, but to begin with, you know, the timeline that got us to what we have or as far as understanding of um, the third ventricle is from the times of Herophilus. We're talking about more than 2,000 years ago with the description of the third ventricle and more in detail with anatomical dissections of the brain with Galen about uh, 100 years later. But really the first understanding of the anatomical description of the third ventricle was uh, using... Uh, wax casting of an ox brain by Leonardo da Vinci and described the whole ventricular system in addition to the third ventricle itself. This was followed uh, shortly thereafter by Domenico where he described CSF and uh, really described the communication between the ventricular and subarachnoid uh, spaces and the circulation of fluid in uh, the brain. And then the use of this information uh, with the scopes with Dandy and uh, the choroid plexus excisions to treat hydrocephalus uh, started to develop in the early 1900s. And then McNichol in 1926, uh, where he tried to use uh, endoscopic um, third ventriculostomy techniques using a 19 gauge needle in Africa. He would just do it transcutaneously through the fontanelle of open kids and walk through the floor of the third ventricle until he got into the uh, targeted space to create um, an opening or channel to treat the hydrocephalus. 
And this was followed by the first description of uh, endoscopic uh, third ventriculostomy by Mixter. You know, Mixter is known for his um, spine work and disc disease. And then this interest in endoscopic treatments started to wane with the introduction of uh, the shunt procedures and treatment of hydrocephalus in the mid-1950s uh, with a beautiful talk. I don't know if you uh, were um, involved in this previously with Naren's history of hydrocephalus and shunting was, um, you know, deep dive review of hydrocephalus. And then uh, another resurgence in the 1980s with the introduction of fiber optic uh, endoscopy and starting to have more cohorts or case series of patients that have been successfully treated uh, for their hydrocephalus with ETVs with Jones publishing about 25 patients uh, showing a good success in his group. Um, Lespinaz in 1990 was the first to use the cystoscope to uh, create um, fulguration or choroid plexus cauterization. And then Danny also refined this method calling it ventriculoscopy and tried to treat hydrocephalic patients using um, the endoscope to excise tumors or treat hydrocephalus by cauterizing the choroid plexus or creating a complete excision of choroid plexus um, removal to treat hydrocephalus. And, uh, you know, he, in his uh, papers and his commentary, he uh, really limited the usage of the uh, scopes. And at the time, you have to understand that the scopes that we use today are completely different from before, and they're uh, utilizing natural lights. And, you know, the initial scopes were using candlelight to be able to look into the uh, depth of a certain cavity. And then the introduction of better lenses and better scopes allowed us through the transition of the bladder urology work to transition to the neurosurgery. And Mixter was the first to describe the first ETV using a urethroscope and a probe. <clears throat> and again, uh, some of the uh, pictures of uh, Lespinaz's um, scopes, and you can see the uh, rudimentary scopes that you are using here without the ability to use any instruments. And then the subsequent usage of the scopes by Dandy and adjustments with the uh, endoscopic tooling to be able to cauterize the tissues. Um, and you can see here, uh, left side picture of Mixter, who was the first person who was able to perform a complete endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And uh, Tracy Hupman here on the right side, who was the first to use electrocautery to be able to cauterize the choroid plexus. Uh, from an endoscopic approach. And really the person that advanced a lot our endoscopic um, uh, techniques is Tracy Hopkins here. You see his picture on the left upper corner and you can see the scopes that we use today is based on this technology with multiple intraluminal lenses with air gaps in between uh, to adjust for the changes in the refraction of water and fluids and air and be able to have a better illumination and picture. <clears throat> and this is a, a picture of um, uh, Dr. Guillaume from France, where he, in the 1980s, started to use fiber optic uh, uh, illumination to be obtaining um, better uh, pictures and better lighting and maneuverability of the scope. So the popularity of ETV waned mostly after the introduction of um, VP shunts, but then with the introduction of minimally invasive neurosurgery, a lot of um, faculties uh, and uh, fantastic minds started to bring together technology from the engineering side and uh, introduce it more into the neurosurgical field to perform our neuroendoscopic approaches. <clears throat> so the indications, pretty much it's obvious uh, with the idiopathic stenosis of the cerebral aqueduct causing uh, obstructive hydrocephalus, but also the indication started to expand a little bit further with other stenosis or stenotic areas in the uh, hydrocephalic patients, including posterior fossa tumors or stenosis in the foramen magnum or lushka, uh, creating obstructive hydrocephalus or patients with repeated shunt malfunction. And everybody here uh, can uh, attest to those complicated patients that you try everything possible with shunting and then you try an ETV as an adjunct to try to help them with hydrocephalus um, management. You can also expand that indication more to uh, septostomies and um, treatment of isolated and large lateral ventricles or even in Dandy Walker malformation where there are some successes in the treatment of um, those hydrocephalic patients. So ventricle syndrome is, um, you know, a difficult uh, intervention to begin with and navigation using 
large scopes and very small quarters can be dangerous sometimes. And there's only few case reports being uh, described uh, for the management and also uh, more and more uh, description of communicating hydrocephalus being treated through the endoscopic third uh, ventriculostomy approach to address the hydrocephalus. But to summarize really the success uh, groups, you can uh, really uh, summarize the high success rates are the ones that have some form of obstructive hydrocephalus with uh, salvage of the CSF drainage pathways downstream. The intermediate success rates between 50 to 75 percent are patients with uh, previous shunted myelomeningoceles, congenital aqueductal stenosis, arachnoid cysts, or Dandy Walker malformations, or recurrent shunt malfunction or infections. And really, the low success rates are the ones that have radiation, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, post infectious, or even difficult um, 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 infected um, tuberculous meningitis patients. But the game changer in understanding the success of the ETV is the Kulkarni score, as everybody's familiar with. And uh, it's really an elegant score and very simple and predictive in its uh, abilities and powers. And if you're not familiar with this, it's uh, definitely present online in the calculation uh, uh, calculators. But it's very simple and elegant in the way it's been um, uh, presented. If, if you had a previous shunt, then your success uh, is slightly lower. Uh, patients who are more than one year of age uh, are usually have a very good success, especially if they're presenting with an obstructive form of hydrocephalus. And the patients who have uh, complications from infection or irritation or inflammation have really a low success in getting treated. And you can see from their paper published a while back that the pre predictability of success of an ETV is dependent on the number scoring and the higher the total number you have, the higher prediction of their um, success. But again, the favorable features are, you know, patients are, that are older, no prior radiation and no history of meningitis or hemorrhage. And on radiological imaging, you have some form of obstruction of uh, fluid throughout the uh, pathways, lack of aqueductal flow and thin third ventricle floor or down bulging of the third ventricle floor. Contraindications or poor uh, uh, results are usually, like I said, due to inflammation or um, small ventricles or thin cortical mantle. To really do a good job with the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, anatomy is absolutely key and understanding the anatomy is important to be able to safely maneuver or uh, tackle any surgical intervention, including endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And you're looking at the very tight quarters between the diencephalon. It's in the midline, it's slit-like, and you can easily cross over to the contralateral side and you know, tug in on the fornices and cause major damage or hemorrhages if you're not familiar with ventricular anatomy. And this is the casting of the ventricles, and I'm sure uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, uh, wax casting was slightly less... Um, uh, intricate as a human brain, uh, as uh, you know, an ox's brain doesn't have uh, the supratentorial development as a human brain. But again, this is all the communicating fluid pathways from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle and fourth ventricle out through the foramina of Lushka and Magendi. The anatomy of the third ventricle um, is um, extends from the lamina terminalis anteriorly, which is the uh, primitive anterior neuropore termination. Um, and closure uh, of the anterior neuropore is the lamina terminalis, which just above the optic chiasm here. And this is another pathway of performing an endoscopic, or not an endoscopic, an open third ventriculostomy, and typically done when you're performing an anterior uh, approach to the aneurysm of the anterior communicating artery uh, to try to resolve the hydrocephalus. Um, the Superior end of the cerebral aqueduct posteriorly is the uh, uh, posterior portion of the third ventricle, and it, all of it is lined by columnar epithelium. This is a bottom-up view for uh, the third ventricle, and you see the optic chiasm here and the lamina terminalis just above that. But it also shows the, the intricate uh, association with uh, major vessels like the uh, carotid arteries on each side and also looking from the top down through the interferniceal approach uh, the third ventricle and the choroid plexus in its roof and inside the tight quarters of the third ventricle you're also um, 
very close in um, the relationship of the genu of the internal capsule to the foramen of Monroe here. So lateral to the foramen of Monroe, you're going to be very close to the genu of the internal capsule. And you can easily imagine if you're dilating that area or getting with large scopes in a tight quarters, you can cause a significant hemiparesis in the patient. The posterior wall is uh, the pineal gland, posterior commissure and the cerebral aqueduct and the habenular aqueduct, as you can see in those um, delineated numbers. And also the roof of the third ventricle is uh, the ependema stretching between the two thalami. And just underneath that is the internal cerebral vein in the roof of the third ventricle. The floor is um, formed by the optic chiasm anteriorly, uh, working our way backwards, the infundibulum, mammalier bodies, tubercinarium, the perforated, uh, posterior perforated substance and the tegmentum of the midbrain. And you can see that in a higher magnification picture with all the structures that you can easily damage and create a lot of pathology uh, if you're not familiar with the anatomy of the third ventricle. And not every floor of the, th the third ventricle is the same as Naren has alluded to with some nuclei very close into that area, but also a lot of the pathways can be stretched just by uh, tackling the endoscopic uh, third ventriculostomy or even dilating the stoma, which you really need to be uh, more than five millimeters to achieve a good successful uh, third ventriculostomy, not just for the short term, but also long term successes of keeping the stoma open. And you can see all these hypothalamic uh, nuclei in this location, and you can easily damage any of those uh, and create long lasting, um, significant damage in the patient. And you'll also uh, see in some of the textbooks the hypothalamic sulcus that divides the uh, thalamus into the hypothalamic area. And this is a little bit um, more. Uh, anatomical uh, description of the hypothalamic sulcus. And you can see it's fairly uh, more dominant for the thalamic portion with the interthalamic um, adhesion uh, or the massa intermedia in between and the ventral portion of the hypothalamus where most of the endoscopic third ventriculostomy work is performed. There are several recesses and small pockets in this um, uh, third ventricle. And you can see from the infundibular, the optic, the anterior, suprapineal, and pineal. So you can see a lot of small pockets, and you can navigate the posterior pockets more freely with the flexible scopes. It's really hard with the straight scope to see uh, um, in the suprapineal areas. But also, uh, you can envision those areas to be a problem area, especially in distorted third ventricles, especially in patients with myelomeningocele. And you can see here where you can falsely um, um, note that this is a certain recess, but typically it uh, can lead you into a much more dangerous anatomical area in the brain. The tools that you will have at your hand are multiple, but pretty much it's either straight uh, microscopes or flexible microscopes. And the comparison of these two, uh, you know, used to be it's better imaging, high resolution, wider view, better color, and better light transmission in the rigid scopes, but it's less maneuverable, maneuverable. But I think, you know, with the newer flexible scopes, you can get a very high resolution, better picture, and uh, better navigation and steerability with the flexible scope. It's kind of a steep learning curve using the flexible scope, especially uh, if you're using tooling and um, uh, having the appropriate tooling to do your uh, uh, maneuvering or treatment. But once you get uh, facile and good at it and know how to orient yourself uh, to the obtained image becomes um, a much higher uh, quality type of navigation into the ventricle. The endoscopic anatomy is also absolutely key. So if you're not familiar with endoscopic anatomy, that's the first step when you're approaching the uh, third ventricle is to understand which side of the ventricle you're in to confirm and make sure that you're not causing undue ha damage or harm to the patient. And understanding the relationship of the choroid plexus to the thalamus striate vein and septal vein is uh, absolutely important to identify left to right uh, ventricles and entry points uh, appropriately into the third ventricle. But, you know, a lot of times the post-infectious or post-hemorrhagic um, uh, patients tend to have no anatom anatomical landmarks. So it's you know, very important to have some form of navigation, especially nowadays with uh, stereotactic navigation to help orient yourself. And the 
floor of the third ventricle, you will note several important features and you have to identify the mammary bodies and the infundibulum, which are key components to make sure you don't um, enter into um, a highly um, delicate and very morbid area if you injure in that location. And your um, entry point is in this translucent membrane, the tuber scenarium, just posterior to the clivus, uh, anterior to the vascular artery or posterior cerebral arteries on the superior portion of the vasculature. The mammary bodies um, are, again, important to identify. So seeing that is key and also having the infundibulum in your um, uh, target point is important. But also you can um, note that the fornix is in your visual field and you can sometimes see the anterior commissure or the massa intermediate posteriorly to uh, identify important structures in the ventricle. And when you get into that prepontine space, uh, you have to identify important structures and you can see sometimes the sexual nerve um, or other cranial nerves uh, deeper in that uh, location, especially with uh, pathology that expands that area like supracellular arachnoid cysts, where you can see everything from the third ventricle down into the foramen magnum sometimes. And this is uh, an old uh, ETV video where you can see the blunt instrument going into the area anterior to the uh, mammary bodies posterior to the infundibulum and creation of that opening to complete the endoscopic ventriculostomy. But there's so many different ways to create uh, this type of op opening and there's no way I can tell you uh, based on your practice or techniques that this is more superior. I think the most important thing is to be... Uh, consistent and safe in the way you create that opening. Um, so you see sometimes, like our colleagues has described, those uh, membranes can be very thick and hard to achieve an opening. And then creating that extra opening with the balloon fogarty can cause more microscopic hemorrhages or bleeds. And it can be tough sometimes to control the bleeding sometimes. And this is what I wanted to note as far as the third ventricular anatomy. What you see in lectures is not sometimes what you see in clinical practice. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you can't even identify where is the floor of the third ventricle to be able to create um, your openings. And also there's lots of different connecting pathways between a massive uh, interthalamic adhesion or massive uh, massa intermedia or even an anterior commissure that can be in your way to uh, achieve the complete opening. And again, in patients who have myelomeningocele with the stretch of the um, skull base or the brain uh, and brainstem, this can be elongated and kind of, kind of difficult to know exactly where to do your uh, or create your opening. And sometimes navigation can be helpful as an adjunct. But again, if you go back to the Kulkarni paper, with the Milo patients had a very good success uh, score in achieving the treatment of hydrocephalus. But again, the the back side of it is that accomplishing it, and I can make sure that our colleagues here who have done ETVs and Milo patients, uh, the anatomy is very challenging sometimes to complete. As far as uh, technique for pre-op, you need um, you know an MRI plus or minus uh, CT scan. The patient um, should be positioned in supine. Some people advocate for pins. I've had mentors have told me their patients woke up in the middle of the procedure or were coughing, uh, so they tend to put them in pins. Um, patient position to the uh, location of the arms of the hand so you can you know, be rested and be able to be in that position for a long, prolonged period of time is key. So leveling the patient to your um, best uh, physiologic or um, um, helpful way to uh, uh, navigate or um, treat the patient is absolutely key. And sometimes you can use a scope holder that uh, I typically use sometimes for the flexible scope. Entry points can be variable, especially uh, dependent on where you want to get into the ventricle as uh, either anterior or posterior. And having navigation can help you localize better exactly where the entry point should be to achieve your goal. And, um, you know, you need to um, inspect the entry point uh, into the lateral ventricle. Once you get into the lateral ventricle, you have to identify if you're left side or right side, confirm that you're in a correct position. Even though the technology can be helpful, you also have to confirm 
visually. Uh, you inspect the third ventricle floor, identify key structures like I uh, reviewed previously, and create a large opening, at least five millimeters, either with a Fogarty balloon or even with your scope itself. You can uh, try to dilate the opening as mm -hmm. you're uh, accomplished your ETV. We also have to inspect the prepontine cistern, and that's important to make sure that the liliquist membrane is adequately dissected to create an adequate flow into the prepontine fossa. <clears throat> you can uh, perform a free-handed method, and some of my uh, uh, older mentors have done that before, and it's kind of unnerving, especially when you're uh, advancing a scope several centimeters into the brain until you get into that uh, ventricle itself. So sometimes it's helpful to use a freehand um, you know, brain needle or an EVD and work uh, through that path into the ventricle again, but then you risk uh, losing some CSF and collapsing that ventricle. Um, so I tend to perform this more on a stereotactic method. And I think nowadays with the stereotaxy, it's uh, helpful to prevent errors and achieve a um, much better approach to the ventricle and not um, you know, depend on, on your judgment or uh, freehand technique, which can be in just in EVD literature up to a third um, malposition every pass of the ventricle into the, uh, every pass of the EVD into the ventricle. You know, a lot of times um, you can get stuck with the dura itself. So having a nice wide durotomy is important to the size of the actual um, scope itself. So making it nice and wide to accommodate the entry of the uh, trocar or the, um, the scope size is key. And introducing uh, the endoscope through stealth navigation can be helpful. Sometimes you can use the Medtronic um, stealth um, lollipop needle to put into the scope itself and you can use it to live advance the scope and identify structures in the third ventricle. The technique, um, uh, you can use, like I said, several different types. I think the electrocautery and cutting probes are very um, high risk and these are where the literature have shown um, some patients who have uh, really had uh, some damage from this. So I tend to stay away from it. Uh, one of our colleagues recently uh, showed uh, an ETV using uh, irrigation and high uh, fluid uh, uh, irrigation to create their ETVs. Um, and you can uh, use just the blunt tip of the Medtronic stealth probe sometimes to create the ETV opening. Uh, you must explore the prepontine space like I described and make sure it's open and there's adequate flow into the prepontine space. And um, Usually, if you have excessive bleeding, either gentle pressure over that site or irrigation can help. And if it's really massive bleeding, um, you can really empty the um, ventricle uh, in total and put some pressure uh, using the scope uh, to be able to better visualize where the bleeding is. So because some, you know, if you have one droplet of blood, it can become really difficult to uh, visualize the area uh, if, if it's uh, become obscurant uh, for your vision. Um, another important factor in the decision making on performing the surgery is your uh, you know, judgmental distractions that I wanted to go over here. And a lot of times, you know, we want to make sure we don't do harm to patients. But, you know, if you go into the self-belief that everything is possible and every risk is acceptable, you're going to hurt patients. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, worrisome um, about your perspective towards your colleagues and the decisions that you're making of aborting uh, procedure can be affecting your clinical judgment. Fear of medical legal actions can also, uh, you know, alter your judgment or change uh, in your management. And it's very important to uh, highlight the role of a surgical mentor. A lot of my practice is based on uh, wise um, uh, mentors and colleagues that have given me a lot of insight and lots of pearls that I could have not obtained on my own and uh, distilled many years of experience through one or two statements. Uh, the second uh, factor influence decision making is family related. You know, if, uh, if you know, there's a belief that this uh, surgeon is going to cure you from your medical problem, you probably are looking at the wrong surgeon because, you know, we're all fallible, we're all going to make mistakes, and we're here to help patients. And if you're asking me to uh, be the one and only person in the world to uh, 
change your uh, outcome. It's probably a lot of responsibility and uh, very uh, uh, fraught uh, decision making and can cause or influence incorrect decisions during surgery. And others and less uh, uh, of a factorial decision making is technical or medical related, and these can be circumvented uh, if you realize them off the bat. Uh, in my practice, I put a gel foam pledget at the burr hole. Um, I've seen, especially in elderly patients, where it's hard to um, coagulate all the calcified um, vasculature of the skin. You can have some leakage of blood into the ventricle and can cause, you know, casting. Uh, I've seen one patient uh, in my training that had this issue, so I take the time to uh, you know, close the burr hole or even put a burr hole cover after putting a piece of gel foam on top and close the um, scalp anatomically. There's lots of complications with ETVs. Uh, the, there are the obvious ones and there's the non-obvious ones. You know, bradycardia could be uh, intraoperative and can, call, can be seen in about half the patients. And I attribute that mostly to navigation and also irrigation and high fluid irrigation. So I'm very cognizant at, you know, me, uh, using as uh, irrigation as needed, not over uh, uh, performing the irrigation. It can cause choroid plexus injury or basal or artery injury that can have uh, devastating consequences. Postoperatively and less common, you know, patients can have headaches, subdural hygromas, if, especially if we have a sudden decrease in the fluid um, um, pressures or even epidural CSF leaks from the wounds, which can create um, complications like ventriculitis and complicated hydrocephalus conditions later on midbrain injury during the procedure that you are not cognizant of and they uh, develop postoperatively or even acute or delayed hypothalamic dysfunction. Other uh, noted findings are seizures, which are slightly more common in pediatrics and late failure of ETVs and sudden deaths, which is, uh, you know, one of the really worrisome um, uh, factors here, especially when I perform an ETV and what's the best way to follow these patients on the long term. Um, and you can see here uh, just a overview of the complications in different patient cohorts with adults and pH or even in pediatrics with Drake's paper. Uh, and the overall complications can range between 5 to 16 percent. The most common, uh, obviously, is um, the um, reoperation needs, especially with failure of uh, the ETV. Uh, then there's the CSF leak infection or hemorrhages. And more serious ones are the acute injuries or sudden death from an ETV. Uh, less common are the endocrinological disturbances that you have to pay attention to, especially in infants and neonates that, uh, you know, we don't really appreciate uh, thirst or uh, alteration in their sodium fluid balances. So it's important to keep note of that or even memory dysfunction with fornaceal damages or memory body damages. Uh, measurable outcomes in the literature, and that's where we fall short. I mean, we are, you know, Either we are shunt dependent, can we see a ventricular change, or can we identify uh, patency of stoma? And these are very rudimentary uh, you know, ways just to uh, observe um, success of an ETV, and we can probably do a much better job in our assessment. And you can see most of the paper and follow-ups are very short-term, less than a couple of years, and we really need to develop on a you know, international level a registry system to identify the appropriate patients for ETV successes and, um, you know, try to do better for our patients. And this is just an adult outcome uh, overview, and you can see the results in selected patients can be up to 80%. And uh, I'm just going to highlight a couple of papers. Feng and Al in 2004 in neurosurgery showed the retrospective analysis of 58 patients with a mean follow-up of 24 months. And I wanted to highlight this paper because what they noted was there's no predictive value of reduced ventricular size within the first two weeks. And brings me back to um, a paper that uh, Ian Pollack uh, put out a while back showing that hydrocephalus ventricular response can take um, about four weeks for the ventricles to change sometimes following shunting. So, uh, and it was a significantly... Uh, improved at three months and six months after the ETV. So initially, if the ventricles are unchanged, it's not a sign of a uh, failure. And the other, um, you know, objective outcome is um, 
papilledema resolution. And usually only half the patients will improve their papilledema at about four weeks. Uh, so, you know, early evaluations is key to keep follow up, but, you know, lack of resolution of papilledema doesn't mean uh, failure of the treatment of choice. As far as neuropsychological outcomes um, in adults, at least one third of uh, the score of patients had an improvement of their intelligent quotient and executive function. And in a pediatric population, um, Drake uh, in this series comparing uh, uh, aqueductal stenosis and uh, the tumor patients or patients who had previous uh, sh uh, shunt placement, his successes at one in five years were about 65 and 52%. As far as the infant cohort, um, you know, less than six months, their successes are low, a third. But, you know, what is the quality of life of a patient who had a success ETV for their hydrocephalus long term? And if we save them a shunt, uh, it's hard, hard to quantify that today or tomorrow. But I think if it's safe and undoable, it's probably worth uh, uh, discussion with the family as far as success uh, or long term management of their hydrocephalus. As far as uh, pediatric outcomes, if you compare patients with single shunt, multiple shunts, or ETV, the cognitive scores um, were noted to be uh, uh, slightly improved with patients who are ETV versus multiple shunt procedures. And that's from a paper from India. And the long-term uh, reliability of ETV is also um, something to keep in mind because surgical successes um, performing ETV can be up to 89%, but the long-term failure is what makes everybody who does these procedure uh, uh, on their mind and worrisome. Um, Matson reviewed the long-term outcome uh, in the literature a while back in 2007, and he noted that younger patients uh, and high-risk etiologies predicted failure, of course, and there's really no overall change of ETV successes rate over time um, in older individuals and ETVs were performed more often in high-risk etiologies over time. And that's obviously from patient's practice because if you have patients with multiple hydrocephalus um, shunt failures, you tend to do you know, something novel or new to try to treat their hydrocephalus. Um, this is uh, just a summary of ETV successes over time. The highest failure rates is um, uh, at the you know, earlier uh, life and uh, you know, the older you are, the better likelihood you have uh, success with more than 84%, more than 24 uh, months. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve of um, success in ETV uh, with long-term follow-up, where you have a, an acute drop-down initially, which this is where you really need to pay attention to those patients that have undergone ETVs to make sure that they don't have long-term consequences. Lingering questions, you know, what um, is the follow-up? You know, I typically continue to follow patients with ETVs even beyond five to six years. The high failure rates are in the first one to two months and uh, non-absorption of um, CSF can be in a delayed manner. I think uh, Benny Iskandar has uh, really talked about this for a while that doing ETV initially uh, and not having resolution of high pressures doesn't mean it's uh, acute failure in the first couple of days. So, and in his cohort, he's noted uh, response to ETV beyond uh, one week of EVD placement and observation. And delayed failures of stoma closure and gliosis can be in 6 to 15 percent. What about ETV versus shunts? And uh, Dr. Jello went over this uh, uh, before, but, you know, the improvement in uh, ETVs versus shunts for patients who've had shunts uh, 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 or who are being treated for non-communicated hydrocephalus. The ETVs obviously had lower incidence of major or minor complications. Duration of surgery was smaller and hospital stay was shorter uh, in the ETV cohort. But again, uh, the failure of the ETVs uh, and publication bias and age bias is also not uh, a good way to compare these two cohorts. How about EDVs uh, following VP malfunction? Uh, the, it is really uh, a, not a successful outcome for patients. And I highlighted this paper showing only 25% remained uh, shunt free after two years. So it's really important uh, if you have somebody with a shunt that has been altered physiologically with their uh, hydrocephalus, and then you do an ETV that you keep a close follow up on and make sure um, you 
confirm that the ETV has been successful because the failure rates can be higher. Uh, as far as the posterior fossa tumors, uh, you know, some uh, of the discussions previously for this talk uh, were uh, regarding posterior fossa hydrocephalus. This paper uh, from Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics by the one showed that really there's no overall significant advantage for one or the other, but you can see in the ETV cohort, um, they had uh, less likelihood of needing multiple revisions or complications uh, in the VP shunt compared to the ETV cohort. As far as evaluating patency, it's, you know, it's so dependent, it depends on the machine, the baseline, the flow parameters that you're um, uh, reviewing, and it's really as sensitive as flipping a coin sometimes, but patients like to see those um, data points, and more and more I'm seeing in my practice, you know, they're demanding uh, a CNA uh, study to confirm that the hydrocephalus has been adequately managed. So even if you see flow, it doesn't mean that the actual treatment has been successful and vice versa. Uh, P, uh, you know, the ETV imaging, um, like I said, uh, some um, note the stroke volume, and there was really no uh, relationship between ventricular changes and clinical outcomes. And it's really more the cortical mantle and the expansion of the cortical mantle or density of the brain that's important when you're following those patients long term. How about uh, repeat ETVs following failure? Um, there was a nice paper in 2001 in neurosurgery, and it showed that ETV success was about 65% of patients. And usually it's more likely uh, than not uh, closure or scarring at that site, be it from a small opening or the underlying pathology of the hydrocephalus. And the uh, failure rate of ETV in infants have also been uh, studied and repeated. And it's the same, uh, you know, reasons for reclosures of the stomach. But the successes after the first failure means that the likelihood of a second ETV can be much higher. <clears throat> ETV failures um, during the procedure can be due to several factors, and a lot of it is due to the thickness of the floor, presence of uh, adhesions in a prepontine space, uh, the presence of hemosiderin deposits, inflammation, or intraoperative hemorrhage during the ETV. As far as ETV and uh, tuberculous meningitis, there's some successes uh, with using this and outcomes were satisfactory in a small cohort of patients. But again, the follow-up is short. And, um, you know, the, if you're talking about good long-term data, these are all poor uh, cohort of uh, patients with less than three years of follow-up. How about EDV in uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Very few case reports, and I cannot really... Um, you know, advocate uh, for this in this cohort of patients, and it could be due to a different physiology that we're managing um, hydrocephalus in that cohort. Uh, ETV and NPH, um, there is some, um, you know, equipoise in this uh, arena, and there was a Cochrane review uh, a while back um, showing that there's no, you know, superiority of one treatment versus another, but we really need to focus also on this cohort of patients and probably create some form of registry and see what is the best um, treatment modality with this cohort. As far as the ETV with CPC, um, you know, I'll take you to Benjamin Worf's paper in 2005 showing that CPC in the less than one years of age was very helpful to manage the hydrocephalus, but beyond one year of age was not um, um, that uh, beneficial. And, you know, based on his practice or the practice uh, from uh, the patients in Africa, which is a completely different type of hydrocephalus from an infectious etiology, the patients, if they did not have uh, a successful ETV, they would not be performing a CPC only and highlights the importance of the ETV portion and the success of the hydrocephalus. As far as uh, comparison of uh, ETV with or without choroid plexus cauterization, there was a nice systemic, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, and that showed no difference in the ETV or ETV plus CPC um, uh, with two prospective and three retrospective studies. But in the CPC and MILO patients, it tends to provide a better outcome if you're able to complete a CPC in those MILO meningocele patients. And finally, you know, what are the new concepts? You know, you can use robotics to uh, perform ETVs, but I think uh, we as neurosurgeons in the community really need to have better registry data points and, um, you know, using our 
combined efforts to be able to collect better data and um, perform better analysis on how to better manage our patients. So thank you very much for allowing me the floor and to discuss and review ETVs and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Risk, for that fantastic talk um, covering you know, a large area of ETV. I just want to bring Professor Keller. Do you have any observations, Professor Keller, and any questions, comments? Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I, I, I uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, nice talk. I, I uh, want to stress that it's so important what you also said, uh, that you have to look at the anatomy. And especially if you have a distorted anatomy like in myelomeningo cells. And you should all the time study the MRI very thoroughly just to see it. And then you won't have less problems. Um, I don't agree uh, so much that you say for the entry point. Uh, I think you, you stated the entry point should be one centimeter anterior of the coronal suture. Uh, we have to uh, define individually in every patient where the entry point is. So we just calculate it from the MRI and we just see that sometimes it's one centimeter uh, anterior or posterior of the coronal suture. It really doesn't matter if the foramen monroe is large, but if the foramen monroe is a very tiny foramen monroe, it's um, of paramount importance that you have it at the right uh, said you uh, the right localization. Otherwise, you may harm the fornix with, especially with the rigid endoscope. If you have a uh, flexible endoscope, it really doesn't matter that much. I agree with you 100%. And that's you know old information based on anatomical landmarks. But I think um, I do the same thing as you do, Dr. Uwe. I you know make sure I see the MRI, calculate the entry point, and you know you have to have it. Uh, perfectly aligned and if you don't do that you're harming your patients and i would do it for you know my family why not do it for our patients and if i just may say one thing uh this uh how you close the uh borehole um i don't like it uh, to uh, uh just to put gel foam in otherwise you you will get the sinking uh, skin over there and if you look at uh, uh magnum or myself with our board it's from cosmetic reasons, it's terrible. So you should really close it. You could do it with bone wax or with other words, but you should uh, be uh, aware that you have also a very nice cosmetical result afterwards. Yeah, I, I also agree with you. And the more you do it, the more you are going to see it in your practice. You know, it could be a beautiful surgical outcome and the patient complains of one plate on their uh, skin mm -hmm. or the shape of the skull so you know taking the time from the beginning until the end it's not done until yeah. the patient wakes up and they have a good uh, outcome so yeah all these are excellent points and need to pay attention to thank you um thank you a lot um that was an excellent it's storage oh, Excellent presentation. Just several questions. Um, you know, <clears throat> I know Naren's going to ask, what do you do in the setting of a thick floor? Um, but for me, how do you create the stoma? Do you use electric cautery or do you just do it bluntly? And others have, you know, commented that even after creating the stoma, some will coagulate the edges to prevent, uh, uh, you know, reclosure. Others will use the Nico. Uh, to widen it. So I'm curious, um, in your everyday practice, uh, how do you routinely create the stoma of the third ventriculostomy? So, uh, you know, I, I identify the floor of the third ventricle and use gentle irrigation to see the translucency of the membrane and, uh, you know, just to see the safe entry point to get into the prepontine area. And I use the shunt scope to begin with, with the irrigation, uh, because you can really uh, use a small scope. Uh, the mine up can be a little bit cumbersome, and especially with small um, framing of Moreau, so I can use that and identify the area. And I have two um, typical ways to do this. If I see its clear path with the shunt scope, I can enter through the shunt scope with irrigation and thin down the 
the membrane with just gentle irrigation. If I'm using the Minox scope, I tend to use the Metronic navigation needle and use the lollipop to advance and create that hole. And once I get into the hole, I start to widen it um, slowly and gently, either with the shunt scope or the mine up. And once I create that hole, I get out with the mine up and then advance with the shunt scope to get into the prepontine area because it's, you know, half a or 0.6 millimeter um, diameter. So I can really navigate and make sure I'm in the prepontine space before putting a Fogarty catheter and try to dilate it very slowly. Uh, I very rarely ever use electrocautery and my concern is damage, uh, heat damage to the hypothalamic pathways and also, you know, creating uh, inflammation or scar immediately looks great, but I don't know what happens at our hour one, day two or three weeks afterwards after creating that inflammatory process. And as far as, you know, the NICO, um, I mean, it's, it's helpful sometimes for um, some procedures to maybe take down an arachnoid cyst uh, uh, if it's obstructing that side, but to create or widen it, I'm not comfortable using the NICO in the third ventricle uh, to widen the, the floor. I'd rather use the Fogarty uh, balloon catheter to slowly and gently widen the, the stone. And my practice is not uh, perfect. Uh, but everybody's developed some form of stepwise uh, process of uh, dilating that third ventricle. Well, what's NICO, Elias? Um, so, um, it's an endoscope attachment that you add onto the MINOP, and it's a it's a, um, a mechanism where it's like a, similar to a kerosene punch that uh, opens and closes, and you can use it to uh, chomp small bits and pieces of uh, tissue um, while controlling the aperture, the speed of the opening and closing and utilizing suction at the same time to bring in that tissue into your uh, field of um, target. Nice. <clears throat> George, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, that was, uh, that was all. Thank you so much, Elias. I mean, I, I, I do agree with you. Um, I don't, I prefer not to use any electric cautery um, uh, at, at the stoma, even with any bleeding points. I'd rather irrigate them than uh, cauterize them. 100%, yeah. In, uh, just a few observations uh, from my side. From, um, in the adult hydrocephalus, which I have done recently, that you see this pre pre pontine membrane uh, that's different from your membrane of Liliquist. And, but you know, to go that far down to open it is always a bit more tricky. And, but when you open it, it's, you know, it, then you really get the nice CSF flow and you know, the success is much better. But I think the other thing is that it uh, depends on which department you are in, which country you are in. Uh, endoscope is used by many people in the department and you know sometimes not all the instruments are working as it should. And whether you should wait for everything to be perfect before you operate or whether you whether you are safe and only use the only use only go for endoscope when everything is actually very good. Um, and I have um, operated when you know some of the instruments are not optimum. <clears throat> and I got away with it, but you know my advice is that if it's not all your scissors are nice smoothly opening and closing, all your instruments are absolutely working, then go ahead because if anything goes wrong, I don't think you can turn around and say because the instruments. And that's my I think it's worth checking the instruments beforehand before the patient goes to sleep. And if there's any worry, I think it's better to be safe than sorry, particularly when you are going deep. Um, the other thing is that in terms of the portion of CSF, the, the wound and the burr hole, um, you know, I'm, I think one of the first cases I saw when I was in training was a patient, a beautiful, beautiful little girl who had an ETV and then went home and came back with CSF leak. The resident missed it because it was dry and then went back home and came back with fulminant meningitis and <laughs> stayed in the hospital for the next nine months. And I take as much as time or even more time in closure than <coughs> in the ETV because it's an avoidable risk. 
I have tried different techniques. Uh, last ones I have tried is when I make a quite a large incision and then get the periosteum, uh, cut through the periosteum in a layer. Then when I close it, I put a spongy stand in the burr hole and then close the periosteum as a, uh, a as a layer and then close it. Of course, that's, I'm not saying that's the right thing and I don't have many, but I'm just saying that closure of these things are absolutely important. Um, is there anything, oh, Elias, is there anything that what I have said that you don't agree? No, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think um, as a faculty, you have to be there to emphasize the importance of every step, including the closure of the of the site. And, you know, Ben Worf, when he does the ETVs uh, for his um, patients in hydrocephalus, he doesn't cauterize the dura. He just does a big slit in the dura and sutured it back with... Uh, 4-0 uh, sutures at the end to make sure it's watertight at the end and close the uh, periosteum at the end on top. I think as far as, you know, the question I didn't answer for Dr. Jallo, as far as thick membranes, I mean, it's it's super hard. Um, you don't want to, you're going in to try to treat the hydrocephalus and prevent long-term uh, shunt complications. Um, and, you know, being cavalier, these are the judgment um, things that I was mentioning as far as surgeon. I think the only thing I can advocate for is inter neural navigation, but the deeper you are, the less uh, sensitive it's going to be. So you can, and, and those error points can be very small. So a millimeter can, you know, change from a brainstem injury to a uh, successful ETV. So taking that chance, you can devastate somebody for the rest of their lives. Um, so it's hard to say um, what I would do in a thick membrane patients for sure. But it's, if it's obvious and clear, there's no really need to take any chance. And doing a shunt is safer 100% uh, of the time if you're unsure where you're going to go. Nice. Can I bring Samar? Uh, Samar, you have done, of course, uh, you know, ETV in all sorts of situations. But ETV in myelomeningocele patients or the patients who have had uh, intrauterine closure, would you give us your... Insights probably is a lecture in itself, but thanks. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Elias for, for the excellent talk, as always. I enjoyed it very much. A great uh, uh, overview of the topic. A uh, couple of uh, observations from personal practice whenever I do ETV from a technical uh, standpoint, following Professor Jalo's comments or a question. Uh, the when I do ETV, I have three endoscopes I use, either the standard rigid, like the MINAP or the LOTA, the thin rigid, like the PDiscope or little LOTA, or the flexible endoscope. If I'm using the flexible endoscope, the ETV is done typically with the tip of the monopolar cautery without using it, although I will be showing videos later from my training in Uganda showing that uh, it's done differently there. But here in the USA, I do just the tip of the monopolar cautery with flexible endoscope to do the fenestration, then I dilate with the balloon. For the uh, rigid endoscopes, if I'm using the thin one like the pediscope or the little lota, occasionally, if I have a good floor, I know where's the basilar, I know where's the clivus, I use the tip of the endoscope to do the fenestration and, uh, and also to widen it as well. Sometimes you don't even need the balloon. Uh, if I'm using the rigid standard endoscope like the MINAP or LOTA, I've always used the uh, flexible forceps or the monopolar cautery just to do the fenestration, then dilate with the balloon. To follow on, on uh, Dr. Rizek, uh, excellent lecture. Uh, I'm a big believer in my practice now, myself and my colleagues, uh, to always think about ATV for every case. And I always tell parents, if we don't try we will never know. Uh, I think there are three aspects I always focus on. Number one, obviously the etiology of the of the hydrocephalus, although this is becoming less and less uh, important as I offer ETVs, if I see a favorable anatomy. And number three is the perception of the parents of what is an acceptable failure rate. If I have a favorable anatomy, and parents of a baby or a child who are willing to take a 40 or 50% success rate and uh, and they're willing to try, we, um, we're always in. Uh, but at the same time, I agree with Dr. Rizek, we 
we cannot be cowboys going in and trying ETV with a with a very very thick floor. Even with the best experienced uh, ETV surgeons, you still have a complication rate related to. Uh, many of us have seen perforators bleed from the basilar. Uh, Nothing would have never seen a basilar aneurysm, but I've seen uh, colleagues had few cases. Uh, I always tell parents, I'm going to try, but I will have a, a, a very uh, low threshold to to uh, bail out and and go for a shunt. And I always tell parents before surgery, if I call you during the surgery, ask the nurses to connect me with you over the phone, that means I'm telling you, I do not feel ETV is safe, and let's place a shunt. And I've done it a few times, and I never regretted it, and neither the parents did, and the, baby, the kids stayed uh, safe. So it all depends on the experience of the surgeon, the etiology of the head is selfless, uh, the favorable anatomy, obviously, as well as the perception of the parents. But I appreciate the talk from Dr. Rizek, an excellent overview. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a question for Samar and Elias and anyone else. I mean, when ETV works, it's fabulous. It's wonderful. But when ETV works, uh, you know, when you put a shunt in a in a neonate who had an IVH and you know, and then the brain then ex re expands. When I see the kids many times, you know, six weeks, six months later, the brain has re expanded. It's one of the nicest feelings. But with the ETV, the brain doesn't necessarily expand. So my my thought is that even if you treat the hydrocephalus, whether you are whether you are um, impeding the regrowth of the brain with the ETV, Do you have any thoughts, Summer and LAS? Thanks, and anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's brain volume that expands based on Steve Schiff's work with uh, Ben Wharf. Um, so the to the visible vis to the eye it doesn't look like much has changed but if you look at cortical volume density it's um, altered in successful ETV patients. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight also you know the comments by Samer saying you know the, the odds of forty percent success is is um, is life altering especially from a neurosurgeon who does hydrocephalus all the time, you know, saving a shunt failure in the future can be, you know, very beneficial and helpful. And those need to be followed up very closely and, you know, make sure uh, in the short term you're following them, not just with uh, imaging, but also clinical examination, eye examination, uh, head circumference measurements, head circumference measurements performed by yourself. Because as you know, you know, a lot of different people can measure head circumference different way and red flags can be missed and vice versa so you know especially in neonates infants if we're going to do a good job and try to identify successful patients uh, with or without cpc to help with the hydrocephalus we need to have a good short and long-term follow-up as far as your comment which was i don't know if it was highlighted or not uh, naren to make sure that the instruments are functional ahead of time. That's that's my pet peeve with all the you know procedures, especially with tooling procedures, to make sure everything that you have in your hands, you're able to uh, make sure it's working appropriately and two, to have backups. So I asked for like two uh, scopes just in case there's a mirror that's broken in a scope at the time. So we're not opening a brain waiting 30, 40 minutes for the sterile processing to send another device or instrument. So for the young trainees, that's a very, very, very important note that uh, Naren uh, put out in a nonchalant manner. Uh, but you know, making sure you know how to process all the tooling that you have and make sure that they're working appropriately is 100% important before starting the skin incision because everybody's eager to start and finish the case. But if you're not able to educate or teach your trainees or your help to make sure you know how to utilize those instruments it can be a very, very difficult and frustrating process. Thanks, Elias. Samar, would you feel, I mean, I will feel uh, more reassured if when the brain is expanded uh, rather than, you know, if it's not expanded. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Nuri, and thank you, Elias. I think the jury is still out about how we define ETV when it comes to the impact of ventricular size and brain volume. And uh, if we look at all the data that's out there, almost all of it are retrospective. The jury is still out. I do believe we have great news coming in in the next 
two to three years. Uh, nowadays, we have the uh, ongoing prospective randomized trial uh, uh, organized by the HCRN and funded by the NIH, the ST trial, comparing um, ETV CPC to shunts for hydrocephalus, all types of hydrocephalus, except post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus in the first two years of life. Uh, we're one of the enrollment centers, and we uh, are two years out. The trial has three more years to go, looking very, very closely at neuropsychological outcomes at age of one, three, and five years after ETV CPC. Um, and the data, I think, will reflect the same for ETV, even without the CPC, looking at brain volume, ventricular size, neuropsychological outcomes for five years post uh, uh, the surgery, and comparing them to shunts. And I think this data is going to seal the deal into does it work or not? Does it, uh, what's the impact on what is a good, what is, a, how do we define a good outcome? From a personal practice, until the results of this trial comes out, the way I handle it is that if, if my gut feeling is that the ETV radiographically is patent, that the baby's head is, uh, the head uh, size and the curve or the fontanel patency or uh, any other neurocognitive outcomes, if, if I have a concern, I have a low threshold for a shunt. And now in my practice, all babies who get ETV or ETV CPC under the age of six months, almost all of them, they will get sent to neuropsychological testing at the age of six months. And uh, and if, I, if there are concerns, I go for a shunt. Uh, we the, uh, A low threshold to, to convert from ETV or ETV CPC to a shunt until we get the results of this trial, hopefully in the next two to three years, three years probably. Thank you very much, Summer. Um, uh, before I go to Mr. Magdam, just to mention to the juniors, if there are any juniors, usually these meetings are from seniors. Um, uh, you know, the with the shunt in my my humble experience, and um, is that the, the, the shunt is the store operation and the pre and the post-operative follow-up, as Elias and as uh, Sama has mentioned, has to be absolutely very careful to avoid the under-drainage and over-drainage problems before they become mature. So that's um, just wanted to mention. Mr. Magnum, can I please bring you in? Thank you. Yeah, a couple of points. And I think f f fabulous points um, mentioned by everyone about the pitfalls to avoid, especially for everybody who's in training and is in the first few years of training. And I, I completely agree with it. And the neuropsychology testing is going to be the game changer because that is going to tell us what is going to be the outcome for these children because sometimes the ventricular volume is not changed, especially in older children. And with classical aqueductal stenosis, which gets diagnosed at teenage years, that is going to be the thing. A couple of things, I want one couple of questions. One is, if you're using irrigation, uh, is there, do you when there's supposedly a little bit of bleeding, do you use some pressure to clear the bleeding so as to quicken the um, clearing of the blood, one. Secondly, about the incision. Now, what kind of incision? Because I have moved from a curved incision to a vertical incision, straight in, straight out, avoid CSF leaks. And if there's a problem, then you know there is a ventricular dilatation and you can put a shunt in, avoid CSF leaks and infections. And then thirdly, because of my craniofacial background and knowing that the head shape is not similar in everyone, I've got a South Asian narrow front back. And if you go to Africa, they are, they are all scaphocephalic looking heads. So I don't think a coronal suture should be used as a point to enter the uh, brain or ventricle. I think that is a old teaching. We should probably move from that and tell them that we have got excellent navigation and excellent scans now. You can measure everything and put the incision and I prefer it's for my practice has changed a lot with a lot of um, patients going straight incision especially when I'm going to talk about neonatal YVH I can share you my experience as well I'm sorry excellent talk but I really appreciate the comments from everyone yeah I agree with you 100% needing to you know just like Professor Uy highlighted that uh, entry points can be very valuable and these are morphometric measurements from before and prior and not um, typically similar to everybody, but that's as far as you know, not just always relying on your navigation just to have an idea where yeah. it should be. Uh, it's important not just to say and trust the navigation uh, 
wholeheartedly. Uh, so that's one. And two, you know, there's different ways to uh, heal the incision. A curvilinear incision is longer to create the entry point that you need and more uh, distance to heal. And a linear incision is easier to heal. And, you know, I've seen it in the DBS management patients, you know, I've seen faculty who do a very broad horse, uh, horseshoe incision uh, over the entry point of DBS or a straight linear incision. And, you know, the healing could be better in one versus the other, but there's the jury is still out. I think if you're using, um, you know, a small incision and you can hide it if you want to do a curvilinear incision, uh, uh, anterior to it in the future for a possible shunt that's very reasonable but you know if you do a giant linear incision and expect the hardware and a neonate um, to heal appropriately over stressed incision it's going to be less um, ideal so everything is a strategy and you know what i didn't realize as a trainee is how much thought and preparation and insight and understanding has to be uh, done before you do that incision um, from the get-go until the end of the procedure. And those are very high level um, techniques that are developed through practice and should be take note uh, from all the pearls that are provided by senior faculty that have gone through this experience many, many times and came up with a reasonable outcome. Noreen, if I may comment uh, Please, about the dural openings. Uh, a tremendous change happened in my practice before and after my training in Uganda. Uh, before, I used to always sometimes use the bovi even to open the dura, or I almost always never close the dura watertight, put duragen or put out gel foam. Uh, but I can tell you the impact uh, of morbidity of CSF leak or pseudomeningocele can have a geographic uh, importance. Uh, in some parts in Africa, patients will travel 500 kilometers in a bus to come and get the ETV or ETV CPC, and then they have to go back to where they came from. And when they go back, if they have a CSF leak, it's a mortality, uh, meningitis and death. Um, not like in, in other uh, countries where you have immediate access to hospitals or insertion of a shunt or antibiotics or so forth. I learned how to be watertight in my closure when I do um, ETV or ETV CPC during my training in Africa. Always curvilinear incision, always excellent hemostasis, always a very clean uh, uh, oblique uh, dural opening, then retracting the dura with a 4 O stitch, get the ETV done with the or ETV CPC done, and at the end bring those two dural edges together. Uh, and get a watertight closure. Uh, there's no sealant agents, no durgen, barely gel foam. And I can tell you the outcomes were excellent. Uh, and I apply this to my practice when I moved back. And now in every ETV or ETV CPC case, I do zero use of monopolar or bipolar for the dura and uh, get a watertight closure. And, and the morbidity of my practice dropped dramatically. Uh, so the uh, sometimes we learn when we when we when we train in, in limited resource environments and we see the impact on our patients uh, actually better when we improve our dural closure techniques. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Just a follow up question: um, uh, Do you do burr hole for your ETV or in, in one of the units I worked, they would do a, a small mini crani craniotomy? Uh, based on the cor coronal suture to be able to close the dura uh, nicely. Which one do you do to get to watertight closure? Thanks. So for it depends on the age. Obviously, if patients are have a close fontanel, I always do uh, a burr hole or a craniostomy. I stopped using the perforator because the perforator, the smallest ones are typically 11 millimeters. So I do typically with the uh, matchstick drill pit, but just, a, just exactly the size of the, uh, of the endoscope, the diameter of the endoscope, very small craniostomy uh, or burr hole and keep uh, the dura, uh, avoid any coagulation, uh, avoid any bovi, avoid any bipolar, and do very clean dural opening, retract the dural edges, do the work. Now at the end of surgery, it depends on the age. Under the age of two or under the age of 18 months, 
after a watertight dural closure, uh, uh, do an onlay either gel foam or duragen and then close the skin. Uh, if over the age of two, and I know the burrow will always be open, uh, I if I have access to a resorbable plate, I will uh, place gel foam and a resorbable plate. So it all depends on the age. Thanks. Uh, very last point. Um, the, with the ETV, the ventricles remain large. And the question is whether later on in the life, the brain, whether the function starts to, uh, what do you call, uh, de decompensate. I think, um, I'm sure Dr. Wu wouldn't mind me saying, he said he had a patient who was a 40-year-old lady who was who held two jobs and had an ETV when she was young. And then at the age of 40, then she started to decompensate big time. And uh, I think, you know, when we are young, our brain, whatever brain we have can compensate whether, whether when we are, you know, not so young, uh, whether, so I don't know whether we have long enough data about 30 years of ETV and what's their functional outcome. Can I just get Dr. Liss uh, and Dr. Professor Will Keller to uh, uh, have any thoughts on that time? I think Samir highlighted it appropriately. The way we look at hydrocephalus is different between ETVs and shunts, and the visual changes are not the only thing that we need to pay attention to, and neuropsychological outcomes are a key factor. And, you know, that highlights the poor quality of the data we have. We don't have long-term registry to say these are the patients that are going to benefit and are the failures down the road when they have a different pathology altogether. And not just, um, you know, the surgical treatment, but also the biological treatment of hydrocephalus. And I, I'm, I'm putting this in the, in the comment section. It's a nice paper from Nature recently from the group at Rochester and highlighted the use of beta-adrenergic inhibitors to open up the lymphatic pathways and um, traumatic injury to the brain. And this has produced a lot of improvement in intracranial pressure and response to treatment. So we don't need to just focus on acetylzolamide. And in the next decade, I think it's going to be a combination of different factors, multimodality treatment of hydrocephalus and not just let's put a shunt in. And if the ventricles are decreased, we have a good success. So it's a complicated disease, complicated disorder. And well, it's 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 not a complete science, and everybody who's young here who wants to do a career in, in hydrocephalus and neuro, neurosurgery can make a beautiful career in hydrocephalus and still create a lot of improvement in patient outcomes. Thank you, Professor Keller. Have you come across any patients with ETV who have come later on, having yes? Uh, well, we do have uh, several, and uh, it's it's really very important to. Uh, tell the families and the patients that with ETV uh, you will treat it but you don't heal it really completely and you need a long term follow up and we have several patients as you just said they had an ETV years before they uh, uh, came back um, they uh, usually had a symptomatology like a, a normal pressure hydrocephalus and uh, you look at it you see that the uh, ventriculostoma is still open uh, in the MRI and uh, then you you you, you should uh, go further you should investigate those patients further usually with a spinal tap test or uh, whatever CSF temporary CSF diversion you will see if they uh, they uh, recover or at least uh, recover partially and then they need a shunt and one of the problems is especially those who advocate uh, ETVs, they have a, uh, they they have a, uh, 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 how you say uh, they don't want to to put a shunt in because it destroys their series, and um, if we just look at the outcome and if we look outcome uh, good outcome means to be shunt free this is really completely free if you just look how difficult it is sometimes to the indication how diverse is indication. Uh, for putting a VP shunt, uh, you will see that uh, being shunt free can never be the outcome of the ETV. And uh, now you you have to look very carefully at the symptoms of the patient. And it, it's 
not a, nobody will blame you if the ETV will fail and you put a shunt, but you have to be blamed if you don't treat those patients further, if you could, if they could benefit from a shunt. Very yes. important what you said, Naran. Yes. Thank you very much for the important point. I had a patient who had an ETV for a, for a presumed uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, and the patient, and I went into that practice, and the patient complained um, of symptoms. And But on the ETV, on the scan, the ventricles looks actually smaller. The third ventricles look smaller. So, you know, I was humming and harming um, and saying that, you know, things have got better. But I think I think you have, and sometimes you are not sure that the patient is absolutely reliable. Uh, but I think one has to have a go with the clinical picture rather than necessarily with that. This, you know, I think in that patient, I didn't treat that patient. Uh, I think I put it to MDT, then I moved on. But to to make sure that even if, with the ETB, the ventricles getting similar does not necessarily mean that the ETV has treated the symptoms. And on the flip side, that, um, you know, patient might have another condition as well. So it's a very complex scenario. There's no probably easy answers. So thank you very much for the fantastic uh, lecture, Prof. Dr. Risk, and for the fantastic discussions. As I said, I think, you know, uh, I'm keen. I'm, I'm sure that we learn so much from the discussion with, you know, the combined combined experience of our faculty of well over 120 years. Uh, so thank you very much. So now I have got the immense privilege and pleasure to uh, 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 introduce Dr. Shalindra Magdum. He's a consultant neurosurgeon at um, the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Um, he, he has extensive practice uh, of uh, every aspect of pediatric neurosurgery. His area uh, of uh, particular interest is the craniofacial, uh, Chiari, and obviously any pediatric neurosurgeon uh, has hydrocephalus. But what uh, doc, Professor Dr. Shalindra Magdum has uh, been doing for a long time, uh, he and his colleague Jay um, is uh, endoscopic lavage. It's a very topical uh, operation at the moment in the UK. Um, I think the Oxford and uh, and uh, um, um, Uli Tomal in uh, uh, Berlin have been doing this. So it's really good to have, uh, great to have Dr. Shalindra Magdum talk us through endoscopic lava and we can ask lots of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Narin. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Great um, talk still now. I hope... Uh, I can share my screen and uh, just uh, give my experience and uh, the thinking behind why we started doing this uh, almost 10 years ago now. So uh, if I can share my screen and yeah, can you see it? Yes. Okay, just let me put this. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm Michelin, I'm, I'm one of the pediatric consultants in uh, John Radcliffe at the Oxford University. So what we have been kind of thinking in the same lines of uh, uh, what uh, my predecessors have spoken about now is why don't we try to scope someone to avoid problems of putting a shunt or causing a lifelong pain for the patient, not just for the patient, but for yourself as well. Because every time you get a child who has got a shunt, even has got a viral upper respiratory tract infection, or sometimes has broken a toe as well, they will ask, oh, do we need antibiotics with the shunt to have antibiotics with the shunt working and things like that? So what we did is we I tried to give some scientific reasoning behind this. You are aware now it is getting more of a problem in the Western world that uh, severe forms of IVH uh, happen up to 15% of extremely premature infants. And um, those of them have that 50% develop uh, post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation. We are, I'm saying it dil dilatation now, but this is basically a precursor of hydrocephalus. So we have to be aware which of these children need treating in the, and what form of treatment is going to be uh, the best option for them. Because there is no consensus about, about this in neonatologists, pediatric neurologists, pediatric neurosurgeons, about the best management of periventricular, uh, perinatal post-hemorrhagic uh, post hydrocephalus. And basically, it contributes to the brain injury, which underlies the problem of adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. So the 
the hydrocephalus, the bleeding causes very bad neurodevelopment outcomes. And it's more of the, the bleeding which causes the problem is the thinking, which I will explain to you why. You can you understand the active brain development occurs in the first 24 to 40 weeks of gestation. Microglia, astrocytes are important developments in the white and gray matter structures. They're involved in axonal development, pre-oligodendrocyte differentiation, myelination, vascularization, synaptogenesis, and neural circuit formation. And when these are activated by hemoglobin or infection, they have delirious effects. They shift those glia, which are supporting and connecting to a pro-inflammatory types, and they cause problems. They cause uh, uh, developmental issues, and uh, these are happening because there is general matrix hemorrhage. And the iron released from the hemoglobin is taken up by these microglial cells, and iron facilitates formation of injurious reactive oxygen species, which are very detrimental to the pre oligodendroglials and the axons in the developing brain. So consequence of this uh, is that at the cellular level, there's ependermal disruption, there's axonal injury, there's microglial infiltration and impaired myelination. And you, you can understand when you see a child who had who was premature, who had intraventricular hemorrhage, who presents to you, they are mostly having developmental delays, cerebral palsy, and significant disability, which will need lifelong care. In addition to ischemia, mechanical distortion, neuroinflammation, presence of blood in the ventricles, and releasing the ions, they're all pathogenic and they cause problems. And these, these things, I think, need early intervention. And clearing of the blood is most important to to prevent these problems happening in the future. And we we have data for the last 10 years now. We have got children who have achieved uh, school-going age with this procedure. And we have initial about 35 patients who we have published. And to date, we have follow-up to school-going age about four, another 25. So we will be presenting about 50 cases of these uh, I hope, I think this is going to be the largest series which is going to be published very soon. So the relation of the ventricular size to outcome. So a lot of the concept about the ventricular dilatation in children is that this ventricular dilatation is not pathological. But the problem is that what decides whether it's pathological or not. And there are some, um, what I say, major physiological differences in a preterm or a neonet where there's open, there is frontal which is open. Um, what happens um, to the ventricular size? There is, when does this happen? So basically any preterm infant can develop severe IVH. The periventricular hemorrhage, who, these are the kids who develop hydrocephalus. So periventricular hemorrhagic infarction, develop dilatation, and there is the imbalance of CSA production and desorption, and ventricle start dilating about seven to 14 days after the IVH. They don't dilate on day one, but you can see the dilatation between seven to 14 days. It can progress slowly or rapidly, and infants with slow progression, stabilization or regression can happen in 65% of the cases. So that's why there have been some reluctance to do anything actively because of this 65% where things can stabilize. But in 30 to 35 patients of infants, there's rapid progression over a period of days to weeks. And that's where we need to intervene. And what are the timings of intervention and what are the criteria of in intervention? So now progressively with the knowledge that uh, washing out of blood or early intervention of taking this blood out of the CSF is helping the children has slowly inculcated in many neonatal units. And they are starting to do sequential cranial ultrasound measurements. Basing on clinical symptoms such as apneas, vomiting, full fontanelle, sun setting, rapid increasing head circumference, is, these are very late signs. And these, these kind of, by the time you get to this sign, you probably have had significant amount of damage to the brain surrounding the problem due to the pathology I explained. In preterm infant, there are two factors that reduce the sensitivity of the fontanelle pressure um, or head circumference. And um, for evaluating of the ventricular dilatation, which is significant. The compliance is higher in preterm, and there are low pressure, which causes the ventricular dilatation, comparison to the adult pa other patients. And that's why if there is 
compression of this cortical mantle, which can cause problems in future development. We need to act earlier rather than later. And there are large extracellular spaces. So this take up a lot of volume from the ventricular system. And that's why the ventricular system dilatation measure is important than measuring the fontanelle because the ventricles can dilate without having increase in head circumference, which is rapid, or fontanelle, which is going to be tense. Because if you go and see these children, they always the fontanelle is, feels pretty soft every time you go and see that. So ultra, sequential ultrasound measurements in, in preterm infants with IVH is important to diagnose and follow the progression of periventrial uh, neonatal intraventricular dilatation due to the hemorrhage. These are some studies in the past which uh, have been done, and I don't want to go through them. They're quite significant uh, studies which have been looked at lumbar punctures, lumbar drainages. They have looked at uh, fibrinolytic therapy. They have looked at um, um, acetazolamide, and they have looked at various things. But one of the most important study after that was the DRIFT trial, where there were uh, drains put in in both ventricles with uh, washing out, active washing out of fluid uh, with or without um, fibrinolytic agent. And those results have come out now almost eight to 10 years uh, down the line. And equivocally it's shown that there is a very good outcome if we do take the CSF out very early in the, and the washout is important rather than just tapping. So this is, this study has kind of in our mind, uh, you can understand putting two drains in a small preterm who is just about 500 to 800 grams to about one kilo to manage that child in a neonatal setting with two drains running with fluid going from one end coming out of the other end with so many other uh, attending problems with the respiration and abdomen and the infection. It's not easy to manage them. So we thought we probably would just go in with a uh, endoscope and take as much as possible the, the CSF mixed with blood out and see whether that will make a benefit for these children. We, at earlier, we used to select these children when they are at least more than probably a, coming close to two kilos of weight and coming close to the almost term. But now we have shifted the goals and we, we, we tend to do it early as soon as the neonatal unit informs that the ventricular index has gone up to 97 plus four. And then we, we hope that then our anesthetists are happy us for us to go and intervene at that time. Um, there are increasing trends and the incidence is increasing. There is severe neurological mobility and lifelong complex neurosurgical care is required. And there is data suggesting that potential benefit of standardizing the intervention in, in these children. And we, we, are, we are looking at this basic science, which I just explained to you why it's happening. And that is also driving us to do something that we need to take the blood out to help the children uh, uh, benefit from a neurosurgical intervention so that have less morbidity, also mortality in some cases uh, as, as they grow. So assessment by intervention, the earlier teaching is was for clinical assessment where you look at fontanelle head circumference uh, um, uh, growth, but serial ultrasound is important. The Evans index doesn't work properly, but uh, what it works is the living style ventricular index, which is assessed by the uh, measuring the frontal horns at the level of Munro and seeing uh, the percentage of dilatation. And that also included with the uh, temporal uh, occipital distance uh, in addition to that helps us to standardize when the intervention should be there. And you can see in this picture, there's blood in the ventricle. You can understand that blood in the ventricle is for nature to take care of that blood, it takes a long time to clear the blood. So, and in the meanwhile, that blood is causing a lot of damage to the growing brain there. This, this, this is a very wet brain. The blood brain barrier is not established and all the iron in the blood is, is making all the glial cells around it to behave haphazardly. So there are problems in management. There is immune immaturity. There are comorbidities of prematurity. There's inadequate peritoneal CSF resorption and there's high load of proteins. Just not the iron, the iron also causes the blood down project and you get high load of protein in the ventricles, which again, if you think you're putting a access device such as a ventricular subdivision shunt or anything else, it, it, the protein absorption is a problem. It takes a long time for them to absorb. So if you look at um, 
management strategies in the past. There are temporizing measures such as doing lumbar punctures, and that is one of the things which is, if done properly, has helped a lot of children to avoid neurosurgical intervention at early stages, but they're not always successful. The success rate for a lumbar puncture in a neonate is about, I would say, 10 to 15 percent. In Oxford, in combination with um, Southampton and Bristol, the south of England, we they have modified the way how we do a lumbar puncture in neonat and the modified sitting position is getting the more success rate of doing a lumbar puncture in this way to get CSF and um, allow them to diagnose meningitic things and also uh, temporize in the case of intraventricular hemorrhage of neonatal or neonates. And this is now going to be scaled all over the UK and all over Europe very soon. And this has been published in the journals uh, of, of importance. So we used to be earlier that the surgical intervention used to be a ventricular reservoir with plenty of taps or ventricular subglial shunts. But you can understand that the sub, subglial shunt, again, the CSF is going into the galea again. There's a problem with management of the child, with the squidginess of the head, with CSF leak because the incision sites are very close. It's, and you can understand the blood, there's a bidirectional flow of blood in here from the reservoir back to the ventricle till the subgalia absorbs. We don't know how much, what is the rate of absorption in the galia. We don't know that. So each is very, very inefficient way of managing that. Uh, but the benefits are, they are closed systems. So you can- so the plant stand. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought I heard something. The, the, the drift trial helped us to that. And you, you can see from uh, professor's uh, paper in this thing that, uh, they have studied about that and uh, they have looked at infection risk and the ventricular peritoneal shunt rate risks. And you can see that some who have the access device have got slightly increased rate of uh, CSF uh, infection. Um, and you can see sometimes the, the reservoir can be dislodged. They can have problems with uh, encephalomalacia uh, due to the uh, opening there. And, and then the CSF has got a prudence uh, preferential uh, hole to go to, and that might cause uh, enke encephalomalacia in that area. So we had uh, written this and published in uh, 2022, um, and um, we have the retrospective studies, which uh, is available on the, uh, on the child's nervous system and 26 patients. And these, uh, these are our uh, procedural safety rates, overall complication rate of about 15% with two CSF leaks two post-operative infections, obviously one word, CSF leak. So from that point, we have done this vertical incision because we do not keep any ventricle access device there because we don't want that young skin because it's very, very thin. And to close that without the galea being available to close it in a very good fashion, we, we used to get a lot of issues with keeping a ventricle access device there and then tapping through that. So uh, what we have started do is doing is stopping all the access device put in and just closing it straight. And then if you need to go back, we can always go back in the same area to tap because there's always a, a pathway to go in or we can go on the other side and do a second washout from the second ventricle because sometimes the interventricular hemorrhages are bilateral and we, you have to probably go on both sides to, to wash everything. You can see the difference in the blood count done and the protein counts done as soon as the washout is done. This is a week to 10 days um, collection of CSS. So it's not immediate. So you can see the changes in the protein and you can see the protein level dropping down is the success rate of a shunt goes up significantly. You can see the survival rate in shunt. So it's 64.7% survival for two years for shunt survival and 65% um, required a permanent CSF diversion. So you can understand 35% did not require any diversion. They were shunt free patients. So that is the, my feeling of a success, why you should do that. And the delay of shunt insertion is 53 days. So that makes the child slightly older. And we all know from the data that the older and uh, child who is older has got more chance of keeping the shunt uh, uh, without needing uh, early revision or infection. These are our long-term outcomes with um, uh, uh, with, the, with the patient with washout. And you can see the grades where we have done the washout. We have got success rate where there, the patient is able to walk without limitations or with some limitations and uh, some mobility devices are definitely better than what used to be traditionally seen with this patient that most of them used to have 
uh, significant use of motility devices or transportation in a wheelchair. Important thing is the neurocognitive scores. They have shown significant improvement where there are a few cases where have been in grade one, regular school and grade two with uh, extra support in the classes. So I think the success rate of washout is uh, taking the blood out is very important for the long-term neurocognitive outcomes. And we have got neuropsychology for all these patients who have been through our unit on a regular basis. And you can see the procedure, what we do is we do the same as an ETV, same kind of um, access to go into the ventricle, but we use the fontanel, lateral part of the fontanel, as most of them have got open fontanel, we don't need to do uh, uh, extra amount of bone removal. We just uh, do a vertical incision and go into the ventricle. And you can see this quick video, I'll show you that when you enter the ventricle, there's always a lot of blood, but I use you know, warm Ringer's lactate at the body temperature. And I use about, say, initially start normal irrigation, but then I slowly increase the pressure in the bag to about almost 20, 40, 50 millimeters of mercury to give a gentle wash. But I'm always aware that I keep another rib either a small amount of uh, uh, what you call it as I put a, a soft tube parallel to the endoscope so that the, the wash comes out very quickly because with the clots, the outflow channels in the endoscope can be sometimes blocked very quickly and you can increase the intracranial pressure really severely when you are not keeping an eye on those things. And that is very important. And as you see, as you grow in, it starts getting clearer and you can see the staining of the ventricle walls with the blood. And with that slight pressure, it's like almost pressure washing the ventricles. You can clean up all these things from the ventricle walls. They are being stained with RBCs and clots. And it's, as you see in the picture, as you see on the middle side, those are the RBCs stuck to the wall of the ependyma, and they're going to cause the damage. I have tried coraplexus coagulation. I don't think it makes a difference. I, I have used coagulation in few cases. I can also do a septostomy and go to the other ventricle from the same side, because of the flexibility of the fontanel, you can manipulate the scope and get the clots out uh, pretty decently, as long as the patient is stable. And I have, till now, not needed to abandon this procedure because of uh, bradycardia or something which is happening to the patient. And these are patients who are, are significantly premature with a weight about, say, somewhere between 750 grams and above. So we have getting more and more younger patients to the theater now. And you can see the clots which are floating in the ventricles. They get cleaned and washed out. And you can and you can see on the middle wall, this is the staining which can cause further problem. And this is right in the clot. So this is an organized clot in the other ventricle, which I'm slowly teasing off uh, with the wash. And occasionally you can use the endoscopic suction to kind of slowly suck this clot out. So this clot is going to break over a period of time to cause more issues. So you can understand why it is important to get the clot, the blood, and everything cleaned out. If you have to do two procedures because the patient is very tiny and not, not tolerating it, you can do it twice. But I think it's worth having a go. Doing an endoscopic third ventriculostomy in this case, I don't think so. I have, um, um, I have done a few of them, but I don't think so. They are going to be effective. Second time I've gone in, I've seen that the, the, the hole is completely closed. And this is the same patient which I've shown you just now, where there's significant amount of blood in both ventricles. And this is just after one washout. You can see about six weeks down the line, this is an MRI scan of the same child. And you can see hardly any blood in anything. You can see some staining on the um, thalamocordate um, groove where general matrix hemorrhage occurs. And you can... Uh, you can understand that this this is the outcome we can get, and this child has not needed a shunt till now. So, looking at this, uh, this is what I think should be can be achieved. And what we are doing in UK is we are trying. We are we are we have got um, um, funding from the National Institute for doing a randomized control trial of um, having an endoscopic washout with against the traditional method of treating. Uh, and that will be a randomized controlled trial. So this is the protocol which is available on the Chais Nervous System website, and this is what we do. Uh, skin incision, create a pocket for if there's a ventricular gale, subgale shunt or other shunts, what the standard treatment in that unit is. But we randomize whether you do that or you go and do a washout. And this is the procedure which has been set up, uh, which will be recruiting patients in the next couple of months, I think. So these are the criteria for us to go intervene. So the uh, 
live in stall stall index of 97 plus or minus a uh, few centimeters for uh, four millimeters to intervene and you you can see this um it's available in the, on the internet for various things so hopefully i can answer some questions regarding the procedure hopefully there will be a lot of questions yes thank you thank you very much uh, uh, mr magdam i think you know, that's fantastic uh, and then congratulations on your good outcomes uh, um, you are going to get lots of questions, um, um, and it's partly because it's a it's a relatively relatively new operation, uh, and it's also you know uh, it's also um, uh, for those who haven't done uh, like me, uh, you know, uh, have a mental barrier on certain questions. But I'm going to start with Dr. Jalo. Dr. Jalo, do you want to put? Professor McMahon, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I think you know your last slides were were um, should be commended that you know you're doing the trial um, at several centers because I think uh, there's a lot of questions that remain to be answered. We have the trophy, you had the drift. Um, um, you know, uh, I think a uh, prospective study seriously taking a look at this to see you know what are truly the benefits. I think there are benefits, but what is the complication profile? Because um, I will admit, in, in from what my understanding is that um, everyone that's recommended it uh, has said, you know, the complications are minimal. Um, and uh, I'm not necessarily. Um, I'm. I will say, I am not a, a. I am not an early adopter, and I'm waiting for your study to see if it's going to change my practice here in the United States. Several questions. How much How much fluid do you use to lavage, to irrigate? Maximum um, I've used is about three liters till now. So I have used significant amount of the wash. Still, I'm satisfied that I have washed out significant amounts of clot if the patient is stable. So I don't think the fluid, as long as means the question, this fluid doesn't get absorbed in the any of this. This is extravascular. So as long as you are aggressing the fluid, so sometimes the problem is that the the scope is very very tight to the uh, to the cortex. So the fluid aggress will be about five to ten centimeters from the out, outflow. So what I tend to do is tend to use a soft nasogastric tube, which I can see, so that the fluid kind of comes out at a less pressure so that the washout is like a continue, like putting another uh, drain into the opposite ventricle so that the fluid comes out so that the, the amount of fluid goes in comes out equally so that is very important what I think but I have washed out up to up to two or two and a half three liters okay and and, and the other question is um, yeah and I guess um, um, have you considered using TPA in the uh, ir in the irrigation flow? I have not considered because I'm not I'm not comfortable with it. I don't know what's what will happen if some TPA is left, where the clot will be earlier. I I I'm, I I have not got any experience, so I can't really answer that question. Okay. And what is the ideal age that you would consider? I mean, you know, I I think the ideal the the thing is now the neonatal is the neonatologists who follow these patients till they are about two to three years they have understood that the importance of doing early washouts and so they are now really pushing very very young children they they are telling us now this this is a child of 600 grams can you do a washout on him because the vi's are going up uh, every four days there will be a call and I, i'm thinking see this is for us it's a pretty straightforward procedure to do but the anesthesia complications and the risks of a small baby to be either moved from the scabu to a place to do this washout is significant. So I, I would be happy to do it earlier, but the facilities and uh, the training of the anesthesiologist needs to be on board with this procedure. So we have to change the mentality of the anesthesiologist as well, because we, we are not having uh, someone who is comfortable because these patients... The anesthesia is generally managed by the neonatologist with the high flow and the other ventilators. So unless we get a specialized um, theater suit or manage very close to the specialist care unit, I think it's going to be difficult. But it can be done very early in life because the general surgeons have done laparotomies for an NEC and stuff like that in very, very young patients. So it's not that they don't tolerate the anesthesia. They are, most of the time they're ventilated. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. As a gentleman, Dr. Neller, uh, Samar, can I please bring you in? Thanks. Yeah, I truly enjoyed an excellent talk on Lavaj. Uh, I agree with all the uh, comments and observations. Obviously, most of the data we have, as, uh, most of it is retrospective, but very uh, assuring about safety as well as uh, giving promising uh, perspective for the future. In my practice, we have a very busy NICU with a lot of babies with low birth weight and prematurity. Uh, I agree with all colleagues. We have to look at the baby in general, have good conversations with the and unitologist, uh, look at other organ complications from the prematurity, uh, specifically related to the abdomen. When I deal with a baby who had an x lap for uh, uh, necrotic bowel or had multiple abdominal procedures due to prematurity, those are the babies, they're not going to get a shunt anytime soon. No. And the complications from the shunt are right. So we have to do something. Uh, I usually in my practice, if I have baby with intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, under uh, uh, 1,200 grams or under a kilogram, almost always we go for a reservoir placement and doing taps until we get the baby towards the uh, birth uh, uh, towards the weight around 1,500 grams to 1,800, then we start talking about, def I call it definitive CSF divergent, which could be a shunt yeah. or ETV or ETV CPC. In our practice, we go for ETV CPC if they have a favorable anatomy and combine it with lavage at the same time um, uh, We if they have a good size clot and imaging. Uh, on the other hand, I've tried, I've done some lavage cases separately uh, at a younger age, uh, down to 1,200 grams. Uh, uh, they're very uh, tenuous. We have to be very careful how much the length of the procedure, the amount of irrigation, and we have to be very careful with uh, uh, the indications as well as what is our final plan. If if I see a baby with a, a favorable anatomy for ETV or ETV CPC, I look at lavage or even combine it with ETV CPC early as stage one. And I always tell parents, once the baby gets a little bit older, if, they're, if they can tolerate waiting, we'll go for a second round of ETV if the membrane looks closed. Uh, or we just go for a shunt if, if, if the anatomy allows uh, when it comes to the abdomen. The lavage uh, uh, procedure itself, I think, um, it's operator dependent and it requires a, a steep learning curve. Uh, but nowadays, almost always, when I have a baby with IVH with a favorable anatomy, uh, I do recommend trying careful lavage. Uh, one of the areas that I learned learned the hard way, if there's a, a good size clot attached to the glomus of the choroid plexus, don't be a cowboy and go want to do aggressive CPC at the same time you're doing uh, lavage because it will cause more bleeding and more problems. So just doing uh, safely uh, lavage. I found one of the, technically one of the best uh, uh, cheap devices you can use to do lavage if, uh, and to do uh, uh, aspiration of clots that are floating is the suction needle yeah. sold by Escolab. You can use for the mine-up endoscope. It really cuts the operative time yeah. in half. Thank you. Excellent talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Samuel. Professor Kola. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I'm well, I'm a adult neurosurgeon, so uh, uh, well, we don't do a lavage, but uh, I just from the beginning with um, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, uh, we were just, uh, if we have to wash and to rinse, if we had a small bleeding, we were all discussing, well, can we do it with ringer lactate? Do we have arti uh, have to have artificial CSF? And I'm really wondered if you have a baby with 500 grams or maybe uh, one kilogram and you wash with three liters, um, that it really doesn't, uh, uh, is harmful with this ringer lactate what you're using. So can you uh, can you comment on that, please? I haven't had a misery. As I told you, we have got this experience of doing that. And I haven't, 
it's it's just it's is the temperature of the body 37 degrees more important than anything else and i insist that temperature remains so sometimes you put it through the blood warmer th system so that it goes at the same temperature i think the temperature is more important than the content because it's going to be uh, I, I, I I was worried initially, but I, I, I don't even now think about that as a as a problem. Only problem is that I the child's head can really collapse after all this stuff we are doing, and the headrest might suddenly be not adequate for the patient. That's the, the collapse after the surgery is is worries me. I think it's more stressful for the anesthesiologist than me. I'll tell you, it's for us. It's it's as long as you keep your slow irrigation going and going washout and again you're very nervous you don't want to harm the child so it depends on how much you want to wash you can start with 500 meals initially to get experience and then you can build on the confidence there's no right or wrong of what you do but uh, I, the more i wash out the better clearance i get the less amount of intervention i need to do immediately afterwards so most of this patient then they don't get any calls for the next four weeks and then they said this patient is going to be repatriated now. So what is your plan? So then I kind of give the plan. So it is very important for that reason. I think it's it's a very satisfying procedure that you do not get called every, oh, you tapped a few weeks ago. Now with the VI going up, can you come and tap again? And and, and the repeat taps with the ventricle access device, you're, you're, all, you're taking, unless you do it on the local, you're taking the child to theater to do access device. So you just add about, say, half an hour to the procedure and you can do a slightly more definitive procedure is my rational of thinking that. And that has been done. And it basically started with me also washing out a lot of infected ventricular gunk due to some rare and wonderful infections in the ventricles due to neonatal sepsis. Uh, and that's how I kind of slowly gathered more um, confidence because the ventricle was full of pus and was solid so it basically had to put the scope in to suck the pus out and then I started thinking why can't we just do this and wash out reduce the protein content and that that kind of in a sense physiologically and common sense wise it makes sense that you're getting rid of the blood you're getting rid of the blood products you're getting rid of the harmful effects of the blood and reducing the proteins and making this ASF clear for the patient's body to start working on the other problems it has. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was actually going to ask the same question about artificial CSF um, because uh, I mean it is very expensive, five hundred pounds or four hundred and fifty pounds per bottle. Um, but um, I think it would be good to look at what's the benefit or not. Uh, I think it be be at least. You know, these children, when they go back to the neonatal unit, they have bloods on a regular basis. So I haven't had anybody telling, come back to me saying that there are massive electrolyte imbalances or there are massive problems with leo functions or kidney functions. So it's, I, I can tell you it's very, very safe to do it with a slightly more fluid than what you think is necessary. It's like we know that 10 mils of um, CSF per kilogram is a safe amount to remove, but sometimes you can do it more. And... In some of these very, very tiny kids where there's a lot of blood and the VI is going up, I have put two small venflons on both sides and then carefully just lavaged it to kind of go through that acute phase. And that also helps them. So something which reduces the blood product in the ventricle helps the child. That we all know. So how we do it and what is the right thing to do it is, is what we need to think about it now. Thanks. I think my question is that in terms of, um, you know, the size of the endoscope, these are so tiny babies. And the endoscope, are you using special endoscope or the normal? No, standard rigid endoscope. I think that kind of gives me a bit better big channel so that it just gives the good pressure to the wash. Otherwise, you're, you're really having a very, very tiny uh, channel for the CSF to go in, which, you know, when the, you reduce the diameter, the pressure can be really high and that can damage the brain. So this is because it's a bigger channel. The gen wash is gentle rather than being damaging to the ventricular system or the brain. Um, but you don't have, in terms of the size of the uh, head to the size of the... Uh, no, I just, just use standard ones till now. The other thing is that, uh, you know, when we do an endoscope, endoscopic third ventriclostomy, at least we are aiming to just go down the same line without moving the endoscope in the brain. 
and here my you know i have, i have seen large endoscopes used in in children and i have seen post op scans and there's a lot of lot of white matter changes i have seen around the brain and uh, and my question is that when you are washing and you are moving the endoscope i presume you had to move it to, as you saw you know to side to side or anterior to posterior i i think if you if you what you call it as the entry point is stable you can manipulate the tips so you are not moving it you are not having translational movement you are having just a uh, what you call longitudinal movement that reduces the damage to the cortex around it and uh, the third question is that in terms of the, the post op ventricular post op brain brain cell, how much is that a problem after uh, i i have we, i have one patient who developed subdural sit it was not it was something you had to be aware that you have to fill the ventricles at the end of procedure you can't leave the ventricles collapsed so if you leave the ventricles collapsed then you're going to get a subdural so you have to have fluid which is adequate in the ventricles to kind of stop having the subdurals uh, forming and there is i don't know whether this was coming from a unit where they used to teach that you, when you put when you put the when you come out of the the track left by the scope you tend to put a gel foam or a spongy stan or something there but what that does that acts like a wick with the capillary action it pulls the csf from the ventricle to the subdural space and causes problem so just do not try to plug that hole at all because that if you that brain is flexible enough to as long as there's no pressure from the ventricular system pushing it outside you should be okay that's that's great thanks Dr. Risk, uh, can I bring you in, please, Nick? Thank you for the wonderful talk. A um, couple questions. I don't know if you came across the work from Spain with uh, the faculty, Marquez Villas, or Rivas, I think. And uh, in their cohorts, they did about 40 patients, and about a quarter had an infection following this procedure. And that's a really high threshold to you know, justify to do this in a neonate. And um, I'm not sure what the mechanism is and why this happened, but the the, the, I, I of yeah. the excision of the blood clot is a key here, I think, because yeah. not everybody is the same and not everybody's physiology is the same. And talking about my personal experience in the adult side, when they have IVHs and my colleagues asked me to wash out or lavage the ventricle, I think there's a sweet spot, and if you can figure this out without the ependymal inflammation and the scarring that develops, you're really going to make a huge difference um, and minimizing brain injury or infections in that cohort. So if, if, if that that is actually improved, then you'll see a much larger buy-in, and I think your study that you're proposing can help uh, ascertain this. So I'm not sure what is the timing that you choose based on the time of hemorrhage to intervention? <clears throat> I think the timing is, it depends on the ventricular indexes. So the ventricular index is going 97 plus 4 millimeter is what, when they go to 97 plus 2 or 3, we get the calls from the neonatal unit to say, this is happening. You know? Obviously, we go and see these patients and see whether they are suitable or they're fit enough to go to theater. If they are not fit enough to go to theater because they're high flow, they've got neck, they've got infection, we don't do it. We just do tap. And first thing, first and foremost thing is they have to do a lumbar puncture. They have to show us that they have failed a lumbar puncture. And unless they show us that, we don't proceed. Because one of the things, serendipity, not really, is we have noticed observation studies that the patients who have got successful lumbar puncture have got less chance of needing more taps than anybody else. So I don't know why it is, but it is something which intrigues me why a lumbar puncture works so good that you do not need to intervene that quickly in those patients who had successful lumbar puncture. This is anecdotal from our unit. We had about five of them had a successful lumbar puncture who did not need us to do a washout on those IVHs. So I can't explain to you that, but that has been the case. And the timing depends on when the anesthetists are happy. Unless I get a neonatologist who can allow me to means logistically where my regional neonatal unit is situated in the same hospital complex it's it's about half an hour 
transport time for the child to come to the neurosurgical theaters. So my plan is very soon that I'm trying to get the hospital authorities to kind of give us a dedicated theater next to the new unit so that we can then not need to worry about those things. And maybe it will be easier for us to do this procedure. Thank, Thank you so much. Version to that. Thank you. Your, your uh, today. Okay. Uh, so I just you mentioned a needle that you use to aspirate the blood clot. Um, can you share that information again? Yeah, I can. We, I, we normally, till till about six months ago, I used to use a soft nasogastric tube, which has got the tip cut. So I used to put that on the clot and gently use a syringe or a minimal suction to suck the clots out and the floating clots out. But with the Asculap needle, which we can go through the minor, it's, it's going to change the thing. So you can they do much more... In a sense, slightly aggressive, though that you you reduce the time of surgery. I think that okay. helps because the floating clots they they are really they are just how got the brain of their own when they want to come out. The other thing that uh, I sometimes use is the cardiac uh, perfusion pumps, and you can really dial how much flow you can get into yeah. to a very minimal. I, I use that. Yeah, I yeah. use that for my pressure uh, system. Yeah, that's one hundred. Percent also yeah. helpful yeah. in surgery. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I was um, in uh, in uh, Oxford with uh, uh, um, Magdam, uh, Mr. Magdam, and Shalendra. I think they have a quite a nice setup in the sense that uh, the 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 neonatal unit is in the same building as the as the rest of the hospital and as the rest of the neurosurgical department. And they have been doing this for a while, so everyone quite knows what's happening, and they have got very good anesthetists who are clued into this. So you know, sometimes it's as much as a setup. And because I have worked in other departments, we are the the NICU is actually in a different hospital, and the baby has to come over to the neurosurgical hospital. So I think it all all little things adds up. Would you say that? Uh, um, Shalindra? Yeah, absolutely. If this was in a different hospital, means we were in a different hospital 20 years ago. And posterior fossa tumor used to get operated and ventilated and transferred about two miles, three miles away back to the neonatal intensive care. So I think it it is it is a it is a benefit to have everything in one place. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Mr. McDermott. That's a fantastic lecture and it yeah. was insightful. Um, and cleared a lot of uh, practical as well as uh, theoretical points. Thank you very much. Um, so this brings uh, me the great pleasure of uh, uh, inviting Professor Vivi Keller uh, to um, give us a lecture on normal pressure hydrocephalus and what we need to know. Professor Keller is, uh, is a, a, an authority on this field with a huge experience and a scientific mind as well as a caring person, amazingly caring person. And uh, he's a past he's president started. of the Hydrocephalus Society. But but the amazing thing that I have known Dr. Keller now just over a year, and it's the combination of um, the scientific thoughts, the careful observations, and also caring for the patient. Big, and, uh, you know, normal pressure hydrocephalus management can really be absolutely transforming to patients. And uh, it's not uh, well funded around the world. And uh, also sometimes, uh, you know, because there are a lot of patients, you can get into having fellows and uh, uh, research nurses and just going and doing the operation. I think that might be the case in many U.S. states, but I think every patient has to be treated as a patient from beginning to end, a consultant putting his his care into it. So, Professor Keller, I really look forward to your talk. Thank you, sir. Well, Marin, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Can you see my, uh, my slides? Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, you can see here uh, my hospital where I'm working in Hamburg. And we have the largest uh, adult hydrocephalus unit in Germany, and we're doing about uh, 250 shunts uh, in a year. And I'm going to talk uh, today about normal pressure hydrocephalus. And, and you know this um, uh, publication from Solomon Hakim, where he described it first time in uh, 1965. Uh, these were cases with secondary normal pressure hydrocephalus uh, with patients with... Uh, 
uh, gait disturbance, uh, incontinence, and uh, cognitive decline. And from his work and from his works, the definition is made of the normal pressure hydrocephalus with the symptoms which are called uh, after him with the Hakim triad, gaze disturbance, dementia or cognitive decline and incontinence, together with ventricular enlargement. And if you measure the ICP, it's normal. Um, it seems to be normal. And this is a definition um, uh, of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, and usually appears in elderly people over 65. And here you can see the... Um, uh, frequency, the uh, prevalence of uh, NPH in uh, this cohort. And you see that as more we know about the disease, as more often we will find it. And if you just look at this publication from Ozell and Anderson uh, from 2015, 2019, they already found that uh, NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, has a prevalence of uh, 3 to 4% in the elderly people. And uh, if you look at special uh, uh, cohorts like Marmaru did in 2007 in resident um, uh, in residents of assisted living uh, uh, facilities of extended care facilities, almost 15, up to 15% had uh, symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus. And if you look at the Ford's clinic, 7% of the people are there. So it's really a uh, um, um, uh, frequent disease. And if we just look at the um, changes of our age structure in our countries, uh, we are getting older and older. It gets more important. So what you need to know is NPH is a frequent disease in elderly and due to aging population, NPH gets more important. Well, if we look at normal aging, you see if you get uh, probably 75, 80, 85, you get uh, gait disturbance, we will get bedridden, and maybe with 90 or 95, you will die. Everybody of the faculty, everybody who joins it, everybody, nobody can uh, escape this fate. But if you have normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, this time frame is shrinked very much together. So we just get this gait disturbance much earlier, we get better and earlier, and we also will die much earlier. I come back to this later. Well, if you look at the natural history of normal pressure hydrocephalus, um, there was a very nice publication from Andrein, and uh, this was uh, from Sweden, and they had problems to operate the patient right away after diagnosis. So when they did the diagnosis, they just classified them with the INPH scale and uh, 100 means they are very good, zero means they are very bad. And um, they did it when they did the diagnosis of NPH, but then the patient couldn't be operated right away. And they did another investigation, a clinical investigation of those patients uh, six months later or even later, just before surgery. And you can see here that almost every patient deteriorates over time. So that means... Uh, uh, the natural history of NPH is a progressive deterioration. And she also could show that uh, if the patients were treated delayed, they had a, a significantly poorer outcome. So it means it's very important also that you diagnose it early and you treat it early. So what we need to know, NPH is a progressive disease and delayed shunting means poorer outcome. Well, if you just look at the Hakim triad, uh, there's a large percentage, they really have the Hakim triad, but not all patients. We just had a, um, a study in my clinic last year, and it was 74 patients had the whole Hakim triad. Uh, but this is a very high number with the Hakim triad. You will also find some publications with only 50%. That means that you also will have patients only with gait disturbance or with gait disturbance incontinence, they also have the normal pressure hydrocephalus. And this is very important to know because sometimes patients are not sent to my department for shunting because people say, oh, they do not have the whole triad, the whole Hakim triad, so they don't have a normal pressure hydrocephalus. So not all symptoms of a Hakim triad have to be present. 
Well, if we look at the gate disturbance in advanced cases, uh, you will see that um, patients have a, a tactic, broad base, slow gate, short step size, magnetic gate, shuffling, you can see it here, and very well swinging arms. You also see it here, uh, this lady, she did fall several times, and she's afraid to walk by her own, so she all the time need to be accompanied by the husband, because otherwise she wouldn't walk anymore, but you also see the small step size. This is a, uh, a physician, a family physician in Hamburg. He couldn't get up anymore because it was even more advanced. And if you don't do anything, you will end up like this. This poor patient wasn't treated for many years. Um, and uh, he is now bedridden and uh, you didn't even could communicate with him. But if you look at normal pressure hydrocephalus at early stages, it's you will find only very slight changes. It's very difficult to detect. Patient will report uh, disbalance to you, uh, but if you do a gait test, you will get uh, normal results. And also, when the patient is just walking in front of your eyes, they will concentrate it uh, themselves, and when they concentrate on gait, they can compensate the gait disturbance and you will not detect anything. So what you need to know is here gait disturbance at early stages of NPH is very difficult to detect and very often overlooked. Urinary incontinence is quite frequent. It starts usually with high frequency. Then you get an urge incontinence. And in the end, you will have also complete urinary incontinence. So this is around uh, 60 to 80% present in patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus. How is it about fecal continence? If you look at the literature, it's usually stated fecal incontinence is rare, sometimes even say that if fecal incontinence is present, look for differential diagnosis. However, we looked at it um, and uh, in our patients, fecal incontinence was present in uh, a third of our patients. And in elderly, it would be expected only in 15%. So that means it's quite much more often. And it improves after shunting. We just published this year um, in uh, World Neurosurgery, so you can have a look at that over there. So what you need to know, fecal incontinence is quite often seen in NPH as well. Well, dementia or cognitive decline, usually it's a psychomotor slowing with impaired short-term memory, impaired attention, concentration, impaired executive function. And you, uh, in the end, it looks like akinetic mutism. But it's very important that you have a lot of differential diagnosis or comorbidities like Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and so on. If we just look at the clinical symptoms. We must also know that it's not only gait disturbance and instability, not only incontinence and dementia. Uh, patients will very often complain about dizziness. Well, dizziness may be a sign of instability or a description of the patient of their instability and gait disturbance. They have a much higher need of uh, sleep, those patients, and they have bulbar symptoms like coughing, aspiration, and hypophonia. You just have to look at this and you will um, you will see that a patient with normal pressure, pressure hydrocephalus, they usually have a very low voice and they will recover some of their voice also after treatment. And it's not only the gait disturbance, there's also upper extremity involvement, uh, which means, for instance, disturbed handwriting. And you find uh, also several times uh, psychiatric disorders, especially depression, which also makes the um, prognosis of shunting worse than it would be without depression. Well, what you have to know, patients may suffer from many more symptoms than only the Hakim triad. And the problem is that uh, NPH is a disease of elderly patients, and that means 
of course, you have a differential diagnosis. You have to look for differential diagnosis. But very often, this is a comorbidity in elderly patients with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer disease, polyneuropathy, or spinal canal stenosis, and so on. So patients will have, as we like to say, lice and fleas. And sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate it uh, from each other. Well, if we have the symptoms, we just want to show and we want to uh, look if the uh, probability is even higher. And so we just look for the imaging. And uh, for normal pressure hydrocephalus, we need to have it enlarged, uh, enlarged ventricles. Um, it's very nice uh, just to have some indices like the Evans index, but of course you can take other ones, but this is very easy to do. And uh, well, the, uh, the limit is usually 0 0.3 uh, with the Evans index. So if it's larger than 0 0.3, you should look uh, for a normal pressure hydrocephalus if you have the symptoms as well. However, you may have also sometimes patients which are a little bit lower than 0 0.3 and they might even have a normal pressure hydrocephalus. If we do the imaging, we want to see much more. Uh, not only large ventricles, we uh, like very much to see also this dash sign, which means uh, that the uh, subray space at the base up to the uh, sylvian fissures are enlarged, and in the high convexity and in the paraphosphine region is narrow. Uh, this is called by the Japanese guys disproportionate and large subray space hydrocephalus. And if a patient with the symptoms and this imaging has uh, has this imaging we know for almost sure that they will have a, a normal pressure hydrocephalus and we might not even have to do more testing um but uh, there's also another uh, uh, another sign this corpus callosum angle uh, which should be sharp in normal pressure hydrocephalus but you have to be aware that not all the patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus have the typical signs of normal pressure hydrocephalus. About 20% of the patients um, do not have this dash, for instance, and the uh, sharp color angel. And this is very important not to kick them those patients out uh, from a beneficial therapy. So what you have, what you need to know, uh, is not all patients with NPH. So the typical uh, radiological features. Well, to prove that they have a normal pressure hydrocephalus, you could do uh, lumbar uh, spinal tap tests. You could do uh, lumbar drain, um, uh, which may show you a temporary improvement. We usually do a spinal tap test and we uh, try to uh, release 40 milliliters of CSF, and then we do a, a, a clinical evaluation, and in uh, prob problematic cases, we just repeat the spinal tap test. Um, and the best, of course, is a clinical observation. You can see here a patient just uh, before the spinal tap test, and here on the, oh, I'm sorry, um, I have to run it here. And then after it, and you can see how fast uh, uh, she can rotate now after the spinal tap test. So this is a, a clear improvement. And we must say a video confirmation is uh, very good uh, most of the times. Well, but if we look at the improvement after spinal tap test, we must say that it's very diverse in individual patients. So just look at this patient. This patient, as here is a clinical improvement, will improve almost immediately, but will also deteriorate very rapidly again. And uh, you see different patients. Every color is a different patient. And you see the different answers, the clinical answers of the spinal tap test of the patients uh, regarding gait here. And um, so the problem is if you do an examination after the spinal tap test, let us say after six hours, yes, you will get this patient, but you will miss this patient and, this, and those patients. So it's not good only to do 
only one time. It should you should do it almost hourly, uh, which is very difficult to perform with our manpower in the hospitals. I will, but I will show you a solution. And the other thing is, look at this purple patient over here. This this patient um, just reported a really good improvement, but we couldn't see anything. And this is because our tests, especially our gait tests, are not very sensible. And I also told you, if patients are concentrated on gait, they may also um, uh, compensate some of the gait disturbance. Um, so um, to come over this problem is uh, we, we just try to get an observation almost continuously. And for this, we invented an observation sheet after the spinal tap test. And the patient has to log in every hour or after half an hour, after one hour, then every hour and after a day, once a day for a whole week, they have to log in the gate changes. If it's a, a marked improvement or a slight improvement or no change and so on. And then uh, you will see here some of the original uh, observation sheet and you see the diversity of answers. So this patient immediately after in half an hour had a uh, uh, a marked improvement, but after four hours, he was back to normal. But then you see here one hour the patient. This patient needed several hours to get an improvement, but improved for over a week. So there's a large variety um, how fast patients do improve after spinal test tests and how long this improvement will last. Uh, so what you need to know that after spinal tap test, a continuously monitoring of symptoms is necessary or almost continuous monitoring. Otherwise, you will miss many NPH patients. And then there's also discussion about objective tests. Um, objective tests are not sensible enough very often just to show you an improvement. And uh, subjective improvements may be sufficient for the diagnosis of NPH after shunt in case. And this was shown by Wu uh, in, our, in a study several years ago. Uh, she could show that the subjective improvement after lumbar drain uh, shows the same shunt outcome as after objective improvement. And we could show with our observation sheet uh, that this which, which is this on the observation sheet is a subjective improvement of the patient that is as good as the objective improvement uh, uh, looking or regarding to the shunt outcome after one year. Um, so subjective improvement alone might be sufficient to prove NPH and to indicate shunt surgery. Well, if you have proved an NPH because uh, the natural history is all the time progressive, you should treat them. And the treatment of choice is a shunt. Uh, usually we do VP shunts, you can do VA shunts, you can do LP shunts. Only very rarely you will find um, some signs of obstructive hydrocephalus with downward bulging flow of the third ventricle where you could do uh, ETV as well. But this is quite rarely, uh, rarely the case. Um, however, we must say, even if you have an obstructive hydrocephalus with the aqueductus stenosis with a late onset, patients will show exactly the same symptoms as normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, but in our normal pressure hydrocephalus, ETV is only exceptional reasonable. Uh, so what we need to know from clinical point of view, you cannot differentiate between chronic obstructive hydrocephalus and NPH. Well, how are the outcome? Um, well, what is very nice, you just can uh, get those patients with a very fast iteration almost back to normal aging. Not exactly, but almost uh, to normal aging. But you also can see here as worse your before treatment, as worse as your prognosis. And of course, if you're if you died already, you cannot get up anymore over there. The results you can see we did uh, a lot of progress in the last 
decades. This was a uh, publication from Ahmed Thoma from London, and he could show that in the 70s was only the successor is 45, but now in the since uh, 2006 is 89, and after one year, uh, 82% improvement. And also after three years, it's still a substantial improvement with uh, over 70%. So that looks quite well. Um, and um, well, also what uh, we could see, and this is also from the publication from Andre, and she could show that if we do treat patients early with a shunt, they have not only a better outcome, they also have a better survival rate. As you can see it here, the blue ones and the red ones, which were shunted uh, delayed. And uh, this was also a very interesting um, study from Yarai uh, several years ago. And uh, he could show that the uh, survival rates of a shunted patient, uh, of shunted patients, uh, are after five years, 90%. And if they're not shunted, it's only 10%. So this difference is really enormous. And this looks really like a malign disease if you do not shunt those patients. So what you need to know, not shunting an NPH patient is harmful. We discussed so much about complications, but not shunting an NPH patient is harmful. Well, if we do shunt a patient, we just have to look um, also how they behave after after treatment. So if they have the operation here, the um, shunt operation, if they recover and the gait get almost back to normal, then everything is fine. We don't have to think quite a lot about this. But very often, and we still call it a good outcome or a fair outcome if they improve. But we never know, is this the optimum that we can achieve? Is there a further improvement possible? Do we know that we had the right opening pressure of our valve? Do we have the right uh, shunt? Or maybe because they were shunted delayed, there is no more recovery potential? Nobody can answer this questions really if we don't have an optimal improvement so what have we uh, how can we do deal with this problem so what we have to do after shunt after shunting if the patient is not back to normal we just have to do valve adjustments and look if we can get a further improvement and get a further improvement and we should do it as long as we don't get any improvement anymore I call this titration of symptoms. I think this is necessary for almost all patients, only not for those patients who have right from the beginning an optimal course. And sometimes we will just see that we have a deterioration with valve adjustment when we try to titrate it. Then, of course, we have to do this uh, valve adjustment uh, backwards to, to uh, get to the uh, former opening pressure. But I have to admit that this going lower and lower with the valve opening pressure, this is possible only with uh, gravitational devices because uh, you don't need a compromise between the upright and line position. And you have a uh, uh, substantially reduced uh, problem of over drainage. And um, well, but what you need to know, you never know the optimal opening pressure before surgery. And so you have to look if there is uh, some more clinical improvement possible. And if you have NPH, you will see and you, you saw that the result is quite good in the first one, two years, but it getting worse after three, four, five years. And uh, well, there can be uh, this late deterioration can be due to uh, uh, several things uh, because the NPH is a progressive degenerative disease, but it can be also a, a shunt malfunction. But we have we know that we can treat this often with a reduction of the valve opening pressure. I would show you this patient. This patient had a deterioration after several years. 
And what I do just to find this out, the valve was working very well. And uh, we uh, we have this pumping design in here. And first I uh, tested it. And now I'm pumping here uh, 20 milliliters out of this uh, uh, the ventricular system. And um, for this, I call this non-invasive tap test. I need about 30 seconds. And you see here another patient with the same thing. Uh, I did this pumping test here after and uh, 10 minutes later you see already the result and this happens very often in nph patients after several years the shunt is working but probably the opening pressure is after years too high and uh, well i'm all the time astonished that after several minutes they have such a good improvement but if you have this here you have this late deterioration what you have to do, you have to reduce the opening pressure. And uh, you can very often cope with late deterioration for another, uh, for some uh, additional years. So uh, you just can get them up to a better course if you don't regulate the valve. Well, um, what you need to know, late deterioration after shunting can often be improved again by downregulation of the valve's opening pressure. Well, um, I could say quite a lot, but uh, we will discuss everything um, in um, yeah. uh, in September. Um, we will have the Hydrocephalus 2020 meeting in Nagoya, and everybody of you are invited to come there. We will discuss about normal pressure hydrocephalus, but we will discuss about lavage. We will uh, discuss about... Uh, uh, congenital hydrocephalus and everything over there. So please come over there and uh, uh, discuss all the new results with this. With this, I thank you very much and I wish you all a healthy, successful, um, a good, happy new year. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Keller, uh, for this uh, fantastic lecture. Um, you know, you you take us through the whole process and all the complexities. I think many people, when they think of normal pressure hydrocephalus, think it's a large ventricle. How hard is that um, in terms of managing? But the thing that I have found was that uh, these patients are uh, not the pediatric healthy patients. These patients come with multiple comorbidities, almost invariably hypertension and diabetes. And uh, in in UK obesity, and many of them will have previous abdominal surgeries. Um, so you are not uh, actually treating the ventricle. Then the other problem is that um, knowing what's the intra-abdominal pressure. The the main thing um, that uh, um, is to appreciate is that when someone has a hydrocephalus, a child has a hydrocephalus, when the shunt is blocked, they develop symptoms and you immediately know the shunt is not working. But the problem with a normal pressure hydrocephalus is that when the patient hasn't improved after you have put the shunt, you don't know whether the patient is a non-responder or the shunt is not working and or the shunt setting is at wrong place. So it really requires a lot of care and attention um, uh, and a lot of pre-operative thought, a lot of intra-operative thought it's more of a, in my practice, or in the practice that I was in, it was mainly a, a putting the abdomen was in a very obese patients. That was a harder part of it. And then there's a differentiating between who is a normal pressure hydrocephalus patient and who is a long-standing overt ventricular megaly in adults. So uh, uh, can I just um, bring in, Dr. Bat, uh, um, Dr. Pragnesh Bat, do you have any questions um, for Professor Keller? Um, Thank you very much, Naren, for inviting me. Uh, no, I am thoroughly enjoying. This was very useful. Uh, I am not a pediatric neurosurgeon per se, but the last talk, of course, all the talks were very good, but the last talk was very interesting how we must be missing some of the potential for helping uh, uh, Again, the condition which uh, some people may disregard and uh, even those who have experience can miss out the potential for further improvement by what they are uh, saying, titrating the symptoms. I like the 
down regulating the wall. So thank you very much for that. I'm not visible because I'm on call and I don't want to disturb the uh, navigation. That's why I'm remaining in the background. But thank you very much for inviting and I am thoroughly enjoying the webinar. Once yeah. again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhatt. Um, George, in, in George Summer, uh, you know, in UK, many of the pediatric neurosurgeons are doing normal pressure hydrocephalus work as well. Uh, is um, in uh, in US, you guys are sticking to just pediatrics, so because you are in children's hospital, it's difficult to do adult work. Uh, Samar, do you want to go on that? Uh, thank you, Noreen. Uh, I truly enjoyed the lecture. Uh, although I converted my practice from adult and pediatric uh, over the last seven years, I became only pediatric, but uh, previously, I, I tried ETV uh, as well as shunts for patients with adult MPH. And and uh, I, I think, again, going back to the previous conversation about when do we try, and I always have the same thing I tell patients or families. If we don't try, we will never know. Uh, if there's a favorable anatomy and there's a patient or a family who are willing to accept a, a lower ex, uh, uh, rate of success compared to a shunt, should we try ETV in many MPH patients? And I think it all depends on the practice of the surgeon as well as the acceptance of the patient and their family. Uh, the From my personal experience, when I used to place uh, shunts for patients with MPH, the programmable valves, in my experience, were very valuable to reduce uh, and manage complications uh, related to overdrainage. And just to bring another point about MPH in general, we talked earlier about, uh, or Noreen asked about 30 years from now, when we do ETV for children after 30 years, when they have big ventricles, uh, what does that mean? The truth is that patients who uh, we do ETVs for, for hydrocephalus, and uh, radiographically they look good, but cognitively we don't follow them carefully, especially if their brain does not expand and the ventricles start big. Did we convert those patients into adult MPH? And I think the answer is yes. I've had some patients who are teenagers who had ETVs during infancy and around the age of 15 or 16, they're behaving almost like normal pressure hydrocephalus especially cognitively, and you put a shunt in them, they get better. Uh, so the question is if, if some of the adult normal pressure hydrocephalus patients were actually under-treated chronic hydrocephalus from pediatric population that we did not treat, and now they became adults with MPH. But I enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. This was a, a very important uh, issue. Well, if we look at our patient with normal pressure hydrocephalus, we will see a subset of this group with larger head circumference. That means this is not really a normal pressure hydrocephalus, which they uh, uh, got in the adult age. They had probably some problems already uh, during uh, uh, the congenital period or childhood. And those are these patients um, who were probably not treated or not recognized or what, whatever. And uh, they will develop uh, this normal pressure hydrocephalus quite often. We don't know how often they will really uh, develop it, but we have several patients. And this LOVA, what you also mentioned, um, is almost the same, but the LOVA is still something else. They will very often have the symptoms of the uh, of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And you cannot, from the clinical point of view, you very often cannot decide what it is. But if you have a lower, this is very often uh, also aqueductal stenosis where you can do uh, ETV. If you have a pure NPH, there's also a, a randomized uh, controlled study from Pinto. There's no role for ETV. Even if we had some some uh, uh, some uh, publications, I remember from Ganjemi it was from the 90s, I guess, from Italy. They had a, a 
a success rate of almost 90 or 70 69 percent of etv and normal pressure hydrocephalus however uh this is what i said already earlier how do you define the uh, the success rate if you just say uh, uh fund free survival is a success then you may be uh okay that this was uh, successful but as i showed you that have you have to titrate the symptoms and you have to look all the time if you can even get a better result yes you may get some improvement with etv and normal pressure hydrocephalus but not as much as you get it with a shunt I'm I'm very much in favor to ETVs. I love ETVs. I also invented in my hospital the ETVs are in the late 80s. Uh, however, uh, there is a limit, and you should not overdo the indication for normal pressure uh, for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Keller. I think I think the the I I fully agree with you in terms of the ETV not for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, but, but the problem comes is that when uh, when does a patient have a pure uh, lower, when does a patient have a pure normal pressure hydrocephalus, and when does a patient have a combination of both? And um, and when when shunts, uh, you know, when a patient is not, uh, not the best for shunt because of amazing obesity or um or um uh previous operations etc as i had once then i did a etv but the etv was uh, the, the the membrane was all the way down in the prepontine system and uh, once again it was a very tough uh, operation patient did well who couldn't walk then started walking and uh, but uh, you know it was quite a quite a quite an operation i have to say and then there was bleeding, uh, and uh, uh, not not the uh, not the red red bleeding, but enough bleeding for me. So I, I then washed with high, high flow of CSF uh, of irrigation. <laughs> then, you know, and then you are not sure, and obviously you are, uh, you know, you the, you have to be careful how much you irrigate a patient as well. So I think, what would you say? At what point would you? Uh, because trying to do, because the normal the patients with lower or lower like syndrome they have got the best outcomes on this population how do you know which patient is definitely lower which patient is definitely nph which patient is somewhere in between how would you well, go about this well you you have to read very carefully the imaging especially the mri if you have a downward bulge flow of the third ventricle if you have a forward pushed lamina terminalis, you know there is a pressure difference between the ventricle and the submarine space. And these are the good cases uh, where you should do, even if it seems to be a communicating hydrocephalus, you can do an uh, ETV. But if you have a communicating hydrocephalus, the floor is not pushed downwards at all. You should, uh, and you have the, uh, the, the symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus, so you should go for shunt. But uh, there is a subgroup um, where it seems to be a, a communication between the ventricle CSF and the subarray space. And you still have this downward bulge flow of the third ventricle. I call this uh, infino, infratentory intracystonal obstructive hydrocephalus. You, and you will see if you do ETV in those patients, you can do it. You will see some scarring in the prepontine uh, cistern. And those are cases where you think you have a communicating hydrocephalus, but with this simultaneously downward bulging flow of the third ventricle, then it's reasonable to do uh, ETV. That's, that's brilliant. Thanks. Uh, uh, George, um, uh, I know you are in a children's hospital, but as Shakespeare said, elderly are just children. Um, uh, do you guys get to do any normal pressure hydrocephalus work or is purely pediatrics? Uh, thanks, Darren. And that clearly that was an excellent presentation. Uh, since my, uh, relocating to Florida, we strictly deal with the children and don't manage the normal pressure uh, hydrocephalus um, uh, as we don't take care of adults. Now, I will say what, during my time in Baltimore, um, the lessons I learned um, managing NPH was that I, it, you really need a center to take care of these patients. Um, um, it's not just the neurosurgeon. I think it's the team 
uh, that has to be able to make the diagno make the appropriate diagnosis, uh, surgeon to place the shunt, uh, and then the team surrounding the surgeon to manage them uh, postoperatively. Um, as you said, they all require s some changes in their valve setting to get the optimal setting for that individual patient. And for that reason, I think it's a team-based approach um, and not just a single you know, person managing the, this complex population. Um, the question I have is, what is your preferred shunt? Um, I know it's a programmable, but do you do a VA or do you do a, a peritoneal shunt in these patients? Well, that's a lot of discussion. Um, we prefer a ventricular peritoneal shunt are what well, we, we we know that the the complications are almost the same with VA shunts and VP shunts. However, if you have a complication, especially with an infection, uh, you have much more problems with VA shunt. So that's the reason why we do VP shunts. And uh, the development is a little bit changing also that we're going to use from time to time lumbar peritoneal shunts. So because patients don't like to be uh, uh, get a, a brain surgery, and also in Germany, for instance, if you get a shunt or if you do any brain surgery, even if you do a chronic subdural, you're not allowed to drive a car for three months. If you do a VP shunt or a VA shunt, you're not allowed to drive as well. But if you do a lumbar peritoneal shunt, uh, you are allowed to drive it. So uh, uh, several patients want to have this uh, lumbar peritoneal shunt. And uh, um, I, I, the valve what we use, uh, it's uh, very important, I think, and especially with all this titration, what we do. We, in all the cases, we use uh, gravitational valves. So uh, we could show with the Swazona study, with the, which is an RCT, we could show that if you have a gravitational valve, you reduce the overdrainage uh, from 30% to 3%. And so we have a gravitational valve and additional, we can uh, program it. And this is uh, the valve setting what we use. Thank you. Thank you. I think just a follow-up question on that, uh, Professor Kuller, is that, uh, you know, one of the trickiest part of a, a shunt in a normal pressure hydrocephalus is knowing that it's working or not. And uh, with the with the VP shunt, I think you know, Professor Kola uses this nice valve from uh, Mitke, which is a one-way valve. You know, it's amazing because it really honestly allows you to figure out whether we are the blockage is much easier and also allows for um, so one-way reservoir so that if you press, the, the fluid only goes down. So that way you can use the, you know, figure out where are the possible blockages and as well as you can pump it to unblock it or pump it to um, do a non-invasive um, shunt tap as if it were. But the question is, so, so that's nice when you are doing a VP shunt. How are you going to do that with a LP shunt? Um, yes, uh, you are right. It's very difficult with the LP shunt. Um, especially so you, you, this uh, pumping device is very difficult. Now we just have a little plate what we just put under it um, and we we still are trying it how good it is and if, uh, if we still can pump those devices in the lumbar region um, and uh, but this is a problem if if we have a shunt and if I have a patient with a shunt with any problems I'm very happy if we have a, a VP shunt because I can test it non-invasively much better than an LP shunt um, however, the shunts um, and the shunt uh, de uh, design will improve for the lumbar peritoneal shunts as well. And uh, I'm sure that we, in uh, several years, we have those available that we can do it well. But right now, if somebody has a problem with a shunt, I'm happy if he has a VP shunt because it's much easier for me to detect and uh, to diagnose a problem where it is a problem. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just going to go back to Dr. Sama uh, Elbaba. Dr. Sama, I didn't come back to you. Um, did you have any comments about the ETV uh, um, and that uh, Dr. Professor Kola made and I made? Sorry. 
the ETV for NPH. Did you did you choose uh, which patient to have it or? Uh, I have not uh, treated patients with normal pressure hydrocephalus for at least uh, seven years. So you're muted. Uh, oh, you're muted. Yes. Uh, I I have not treated MPH for over seven years, so probably I'm not the best one to to comment well, about uh, ATV in my current practice for MPH. But this is very well because the uh, RTC from Pinto, which showed that uh, ETV is not acceptable in NPH was uh, uh, published, I think, eight years ago or nine years ago. So very well. <laughs> I think I will come back to you later, Samar, because I don't know whether the CPC will be an option for NPH. Um, can I come to Elias? Elias, you have Elias does both adult and pediatric. So Elias, do you have any questions for Prof? I think uh, <clears throat> I want to highlight uh, Dr. Jello's comment that this has to be a center-based treatment because it's so fractionated, especially in the US. We don't like, if, if you wanna get your NPH treated, you're gonna find typically sometimes a neurosurgeon and uh, not want, not many people want to be delving or wanting to be involved in this practice and having their whole life um, you know, absorbed with NPH patients because a lot of them are not satisfied and it's a progressive disease. The outcome, even in, best selected patients is progressive over a long period of time. So their satisfaction dwindles and they also always want to get better or improve or see the improvement they had before. The other uh, factor that we see here too is neurology are heavily swaying away from the diagnosis of NPH and heavily uh, shifting towards Alzheimer as the concern or background um, factor in these individuals and siphoning them into the trials to the new Alzheimer's medications. So the workup are mostly done by the neurosurgeons and not by the neurologists on our side of the uh, you know, um, ocean here. So um, it's, it's very variable. As far as the ETV and um, shunting, I think there is still room to understand the role of either. Uh, it's still not well understood and um, you know, there's complications on both sides but I, I don't see you burning a bridge by doing an ETV and seeing if there's improvement. I've had a handful of patients that refuse to do a shunt just because they came in with a whole stack of um, you know anecdotal evidence saying they don't want this and the NPH should be treated uh, with ETV and I've done those and it's, it's hard to say if there's an improvement or not, if it's subjective that the patient, you know, is happy that they selected the correct uh, functional outcome. Uh, so that's, that's my experience. Uh, we do a very poor job just selecting patients in general and trying to pick them up early on. And while a lot of times we uh, see those in a burnt out stage at the later stages. And it, I don't know if it could be helpful or not, because <clears throat> even for Alzheimer's disease, the Mayo group, published a um, 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 trial a while back showing that there was some benefit uh, in Alzheimer's patients just doing shunting in their phase one trial, but the phase two trial was not that successful, maybe because they were already at extreme extended stages. So lots more to be understood and uh, developed in that portion of um, NPH. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this comment. I, I just want to say something for those patients who uh, who do not want to get a, a shunt and uh, because they heard oh, that it's so many complications and uh, maybe they will get an ETV. But what you have to tell all the patients uh, with an NPH, um, well, of course, you have to inform them about the complication of the uh, shunt with over drainage infection and so on. But also you have to uh, inform them about the complications of non-shunting. As I showed you, it's a progressive disease. Uh, you have a much higher mortality rate if you do not shunt those patients. And you have to inform them about everything. And the complications of shunting are much 
more or less than the complications of the natural history of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Even in an uh, individual case, of course, it can be different if they get a, I don't know, an infection. Of course, it's it's worse. But uh, if you look at the general population, it's like this. Uh, complication of shunting are less risky than the uh, risk of uh, the complication of the natural history of normal pressure hydrocephalus. I think this is very important uh, to uh, to have in mind and yeah, if you sure. talk to the patient. Mm -hmm. But once a complication arises from a shunt and they're convinced that it was not the way to go, that becomes a very difficult sell for patients, especially here on this side of the uh, ocean. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it varies and it's kind of hard to suggest or recommend when it's not a life-threatening condition acutely for the patient um, and they don't comprehend it a lot of times um, so it's uh, it's a tough tough um, thing to navigate in certain instances thank you just three qu uh, quick questions but before that i, I have patients i had patients who are long-term waiting on the waiting list so with, with all the concerns and that and this, I started patient on acetazolamide. There were two papers which said, which two small papers which said they improved, but in the in the in the ten patient cohort, you know, there's hardly any improvement. I will, I'm hoping to put as abstract on the on the Nagoya meeting, although it's small, but I think it will be useful. Uh, Dr. Sara Taha has asked which is the kind of a gold standard of adjunct, um, the tap test or, or or the uh, the the continuous uh, um, uh, CSF drainage, or the or the or the uh, CSF dynamics study. Um, uh, one. If I may answer this first, uh, there's a lot of discussion, and there is no general consensus about it. If we just look at the European INPH study, you, if you have the symptoms. And you have uh, and you have uh, the imaging which is uh, concurrently to the uh, NPH. You don't even need any tests anymore. Uh, they showed that you um, uh, lumbar drain or uh, lumbar infusion test uh, itself or spinal tap test is good if you have an improvement. But if you have no improvement, it doesn't mean that you're not successful with your uh, with your shunting. The problem, of course, is with spinal tip test, as I showed you, if you re-examine patient only once or twice, you may miss the period when they improve. Um, but, uh, well, uh, there is still, uh, also, if you do a spinal tip test, a spinal tip test and spinal tip test are not the same, depending on the volume, uh, volume of tapping and depending also on how you uh, follow the patient. If you really... Uh, follow them continuously, you will uh, be much better. Of course, you can do a, a lumbar drain. A lumbar drain is a little bit more complicated. It's more invasive, has more complications. Uh, and usually the patient is not mobile with, uh, with the lumbar drain or not mobile so good. So that means uh, it's also a problem. Uh, but uh, there is no right answer because also the tests are done a little bit differently and so uh, we can't do it but uh, i must say i i can argue with uh, our large volume of nph patients in our department we um we uh, we have done uh, infusion tests we have done lumbar drain but we almost abandoned it we do it maybe once or twice a year not not more thanks uh, professor the, the the problem that comes with this uh, when you have a a shunt, particularly the gravitational shunt, I sometimes have the feeling there's an under drainage um, because of the gravitational unit or because of the intra abdominal pressure. Is there any way of measuring the intra abdominal pressure? Is there any way of knowing it is under drainage? Thanks. Um, yes, uh, well, uh, of course, you can measure the intra abdominal pressure. It's not so easy. You can measure it via the, uh, the bladder. Uh, but there are sometimes um, uh, discussion if the bladder uh, uh, pressure is really the same as you have intra-abdominally. Um, however, um, it's um, uh, it, it's very difficult. I just uh, had one of my my students. Uh, he was measuring the 
uh, intraabdominal pressure. And it was very interesting that the intraabdominal pressure even changed quite a lot, even with lying in a prone position, supine position, standing, sitting, and so on. Uh, so this is also uh, a difficult uh, issue. You may overcome this issue if you just measure the ICP and you can regulate the valve uh, according to the measured uh, ICP. So you, you, you can have a sensor uh, reservoir or ICP measure inside the shunt. But this, of course, it's quite expensive. And uh, for my feeling, it's... Uh, we don't need it really for NPH, but we really need this for um, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, where we have much more problems with shunting. That's great, thanks. Just in terms of the last point, in terms of the putting the gravitational unit, I always have that feeling that when it's put just behind the ear, and if it's not exactly vertical, and if it is slightly in an angle, and then the patient always sleeps at night on two or three pillows at this age, whether that effectively becomes, rather than the patient lying flat, it becomes patient sitting up and then the gravitational unit kicking in and whether there is under drainage. So um, that's my, I think that's my, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the gravitational unit system is certainly avoids over drainage, but do you have any thoughts on that? The risk of under drainage with the gravitational unit? Um... Yes. Um, well, first of all, you have to look that uh, the gravitational unit is in the upright position if the patient is upright. And uh, if you have a patient with a severe Bechterew, for instance, if you have it behind the ear, you have to know what is the upright position if he is lying. And that's the reason why we mark all the time the upright position uh, on the patient's skin. Um, when he is standing, as we know it, when, when he is lying in the operating room, how we have to, um, in which direction we have to put the valve. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, if uh, a patient with uh, a heart failure and he is uh, sleeping with two or three pillows in the night, it might be a problem. Um, and um, uh, well, uh, in those cases, it could be helpful that you have a uh, that you have a uh, programmable gravitational valve that could overcome it. But however, uh, you if uh, if the uh, patient is in the, uh, uh, in the wrong position uh, or the, the valve is in the wrong position, you may, may get under drainage in some situation, even over drainage in another position. So uh, this can be, but it's uh, in the daily life, it's uh, not an a frequent condition, uh, but uh, you you have to be especially if you have some problems and you're not happy with the result. You have to to look at this as as well and how you can um, deal with this. A, a, a situation sometimes can be just to put the um, uh, the gravitational valve or this uh, this device in the thoracic region. Uh, I've always thought to do it to try to splice the. The gravitational unit on the on the on the uh, distal distal catheter, and then when I pull it through, try to pull it through the tunnel and leave it in the thoracic region. I will have to try to see whether it actually works. But Professor Keller, thank you so much uh, for this fantastic lecture, and I, you know I think we are all learned a lot from it. But I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. But my only advice is that don't think that NPH is a is a easy, it's a full-time job, unless as as uh, 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 Dr. Risk mentioned and Dr. Samar El uh, Samar Elbaba mentioned that you have got a good team. But in the same time, my concern is that you don't want the patient to be only be followed up by mainly by the nurses or the fellows because it really requires a quite a high high level thinking from the operating surgeon what's going on. Professor, do you have any comments? Where do you get the balance between the neurosurgeon-led uh, care as well as or the, the the nurse specialist and the fellow? How do you, where do you get the sweet spot that, that, uh, uh, that the right care is given? You're asking? Yeah, you're asking you, sir. Uh, you asking me? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's a very good question, and it's it's really difficult. And I well, you have to have a team. This is very important, and uh, you have to do it very often. Uh, that you are used to it. Um, if you have only, if you treat only five patients in a year, you won't have the uh, the expertise and the routine in the daily work. And this daily routine makes it uh, 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 very much easier. Um, there is, uh, but still, a problem if you just want to have too many tests, or if you have to do much too much work up for those patients probably it will hinder a lot of patients to get the uh the diagnosis and uh, even the beneficial treatment so you have to have a compromise of course at the universities you should do everything but also at the universities you should define what is really necessary and what is not necessary otherwise uh, we will have a problem that we never will um uh, will treat all the patients or, uh, who should get treated. I also want to say there is one problem in the neurosurgical uh, uh, society. If you do a lot of shunts, um, shunt surgery is not very charming. It's not very sexy, I would say. Um, in comparison to endoscopic surgery and tricholostomy, everybody likes it. Shunt surgery not so many people like that. If you do only shunt surgery, you will get in a corner. Probably uh, you're not a good surgeon and you, you have to handle these easy cases. And uh, I, I think this is a problem, uh, but uh, because NPH, everybody now sees that it's so often and has to be handled, it gets more uh, attention and more interest by by a lot of neurosurgeons. We have the same problem as you have in the in the U.S. That we have, uh, um, uh, well, neurologists are not so much interested in NPH. It's done in uh, Germany mostly by the uh, by the neurosurgeons. But you have other countries like Sweden, for instance. The main work is done also by the neurologists over there, and I think this collaboration between neurologists and neurosurgeons it's very beneficial in the end and uh, we we have to work in this direction that's great thank you so much uh, professor Keller. so now we come thank to you. the lecture of um, dr samar el baba uh, choroid plexus uh, cauterization um, uh, obviously has uh, indications that very different for different conditions. It's again an important uh, uh, skilled uh, tool in the arm armamentarium of a neurosurgeon that deals with hydrocephalus. But it's also uh, has a, uh, since the Ben Ben Wolf's paper, there has been a lot of uh, um, controversies of its utility and also how to do it correctly because it's not the easiest operation. Uh, so really looking forward to uh, Dr. Samuel Baba, who's at uh, uh, in Orlando. And uh, as I said, he's uh, facile in all aspects of neurosurgery, but he has been part of the neuro kids group and been teaching a lot of neurosurgeons around the world how to do it. So it's a great pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Samuel Baba talk to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nareen. It's a great uh, honor and privilege to join you and esteemed colleagues and uh, participants in this course around the holidays. I wish you and everyone a happy new year, and we hope the, the new year will be bringing uh, happiness, success, good health, and peace to everyone. Uh, thank you for asking me to talk about CPC. Uh, uh, from the excellent talks we heard from everyone today, we all know about ETV. <clears throat> the best way to describe ETV that it is considered a potential safe alternative to shunts if we uh, quantify carefully the indications, the etiology of the hydrocephalus, the favorable anatomy, as well as the exper experience of the surgeon. But let's go look back at what the scientific literature talks about shunts and ETVs. When the uh, 
uh, uh, the pediatric hydrocephalus group tried to come up with guidelines a few years ago. They looked into all the literature and scientific evidence about ATV and shunts, and they the best recommendation came out that actually both shunts and ATV are options in the treatment of hydrocephalus, and they both have their ups and downs. We know from the ETV uh, success score that um, quantifying carefully uh, 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 factors for success and risk factors for failure are important before we consider ETV. But we all know very well that if you have a child who is over 6 to 12 months of age and uh, have aqueductus stenosis or hydrocephalus due to third ventricular or aqueduct pathology, they have a good success rate over 80, 90%, and it's durable and sustainable with good long-term outcomes. Professor Benjamin Worf, uh, around 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, opened the door for, I would like to describe it as a, as a modified technique for the ETV, where he added uh, the CPC cauterization of the coronary plexus, and trying to see if this will improve uh, the ETV uh, successful outcomes. And he was in a way forced to do that uh, when he was in an environment in Eastern Africa, specifically in Uganda, where the mortality of shunted hydrocephalus, if the shunts were available, was high related to infections and morbidity of shunt failures in patients who live far from any healthcare facilities. And this first paper came out in 2005, looked at over 500 patients, summed them all together, post-infectious hydrocephalus, found bifid and other etiologies, and found the actual ETV CPC to start with is uh, ha has a higher success rate than ETV alone uh, in infants actually under the age of one year. And <clears throat> how does CPC work? We all think that most of the choroid plexus is what we see in the lateral ventricles, and that's actually not true. Uh, we have choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle and third ventricle, even in the central canal of the spinal cord. Uh, we have choroid plexus even in the uh, uh, related to the arachnoid villi that drains CSF into the sphere such the sinus, which means that if we do CPC for the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles, we're actually only shutting down a production of the CSF uh, uh, that is used to protect the brain and, and help with brain development. And the, the goal is if we add CPC to the ETV, will that increase the, the success uh, outcomes? And at Cure Children's Hospital in Uganda, where uh, Professor Benworth worked, they had a different, actually, success score for ETV CPC. And you can see here, I took this picture actually from the wall in the operating room in Uganda. You can see here that they looked at the etiology. They don't have a lot of aqueductus stenosis. The most common source of hydrocephalus there is post-infectious. They have, obviously, spina bifida. They looked at the degree of cauterization as well as the status of the aqueduct and pre-pontine cistern. And if you look carefully at the success score from Uganda, is different from the ETV success score we all use. This one is more technical, looks more into the degree of the cauterization, looks at the status of the aqueduct and the prepontine sister. Then the group in Uganda looked, took a closer look at CPC outcomes with ETV in other etiology, for instance, for spina bifida. And they found that ETV CPC to be actually in that environment in Eastern Africa has is more durable than the shunts for a span with that population. Then they looked closely at neurocognitive outcomes. And they found that actually ETV, CPC, or shunts, they both have similar neurocognitive outcomes when they followed those patients up to five years. Uh, in North America, there was some reluctance at the beginning. Can we replicate the data that comes out of Eastern and Sub-Saharan Africa to the North American literature and North American hydrocephalus output. The Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, uh, almost nine years ago, uh, looked at early data of ETV CPC uh, in North America, and they found actually that the ETV uh, CPC has 
uh, is a is a, a potentially safe alternative to shunts, but we need prospective randomized trial to look at long term outcomes. Around uh, two years ago, a very important study called the ST trial. Uh, any of you, if you go to the uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov website and look for ST endoscopic uh, versus shunt treatment of hydrocephalus in infants trial. Uh, you can find the information. This trial started almost two years ago. Uh, it's supposed to run for five years. Uh, so far, enrolled over 80 babies. Here, our center in Orlando is one of the enrollment sites. And the goal is to, within the next, after five years from now, we can look very closely at the outcomes and we can tell if the ETV CPC fares well in. Uh, similar to shunts, better or even inferior. And I think the jury is still out, uh, but I am optimistic that the results of this trial will show that ETV CPC has a significant role in the management of hydrocephalus worldwide with different indications. The performance of ETV CPC has technical advantages when we use flexible endoscope. As we know, the flexible endoscope is helpful in uh, visualizing the uh, visualization of the choroid plexus that goes into the temporal horns and maximizes the CPC compared to rigid endoscopy. So when the WARF data started coming out over 15 years ago, I started to use ETV CPC in my practice. I started doing the rigid endoscope. I go with the rigid endoscope, after I do the uh, ETV, then I started doing uh, CPC with the uh, uh, with the rigid endoscope. And you can see here in this video very carefully where my challenge is. I'm here looking at the glomus, look at the atrium of the ventricle, and this portion that goes into the temporal horn, and this is where the rigid endoscope will fail to maximize the CPC of that portion, which is the temporal horn. And here you can see one of the videos, one of my early experience here you can see, uh, I did a very good job with the CPC, but here uh, as the uh, choroid plexus forms the C as in Charlie shape projection into the temporal horn, this is where I left a residual likely entirely within the uh, temporal horn. So after the uh, confirming the ATV, this is the, sorry, this is CPC on the right side. This is the ETV. And now going back to the left side, here's the CPC. And again, more likely than not, I left a good residual in the choroid plexus entirely within the temporal horn. Then data started coming out comparing rigid to flexible endoscopy. And the data is very clear that there is an advantage of flexible endoscopy uh, to maximize the uh, CPC. Then I decided to go to Uganda to, to get a, uh, first of all, I really wanted to see the outcomes of those patients. We read about uh, ETV CPC for hydrocephalus and I decided to go work with colleagues, all of them trained by Ben Worf, uh, all of them Ugandan colleagues. And it was a huge experience uh, personally and professionally for me uh, to learn uh, ETV CPC at the Mecca where it started as well as learning from the experts and seeing the outcomes firsthand myself. A great experience working with um, uh, colleagues uh, uh, on a daily basis, doing around four to five cases a day. Patients came from different parts in Uganda, South Sudan, Tanzania, uh, Rwanda, uh, Kenya. Uh, many of them came in for this uh, centralized place uh, for treatment of hydrocephalus. And the technique I use there is exactly the same technique um, I'm using now in my practice in Orlando. Cases are done with the babies in lateral position. We'll talk about in a minute, the setup for the flexible endoscope is exactly the same setup I'm using in my practice right now. Lateral position is helpful when you're doing flexible endoscopy after you complete the ETV and the CPC on the right side, you'll find that doing the septostomy with the flexible endoscope and maximizing the CPC on the contralateral side are much easier with gravity. The temporal, the choroid plexus and the temporal horn on the contralateral side will gravitate towards you and cuts down the operative time. The setup uh, 
here those are pictures from the operating room in um, Bali, Uganda, where uh, the uh, fiber optic uh, flexor endoscope and instruments uh, holding arm for the endoscope. Uh, here are some videos uh, from the Uganda experience, as you can tell here from the videos, that the uh, you can see some dark deposits in the appendix, suggesting that this is a, a, a post-infectious case where there was a, at some point parallel ventriculitis, and here we can see the debris and the ependema. Uh, flexor endoscope now visualizing now. This is the right ventricle uh, coming. This is the left ventricle. First step is to look at the anatomy, right ventricle, left ventricle, uh, and then coming back uh, uh, now after now feeling good about the visualization, both sides, taking the endoscope uh, back to the uh, right foramen of Monroe. Here's the floor third ventricle. Now looking back at the aqueduct, making sure the aqueduct is open. This is the fourth ventricle. We can see also debris from the previous infection, taking the endoscope back to the floor of the third ventricle. And this is the technique that's done in Uganda. This is how I learned it, but this is not how I personally do it right now. As we know, in Africa, the access to some resources can be limited. So you can see here in this video that they typically uh, start, this is videos from one of the cases uh, from my uh, experience learning from uh, mentors and colleagues in Uganda you can see they typically start by doing gentle cauterization of the floor third ventricle and using the tip of the uh, monopolar cautery to do the widening of the ETV. They don't have access to balloons. In the US, I use the balloon to dilate after I do my initial uh, fenestration. I do my fenestration typically using the same technique, but with, without doing coagulation. In this case, you can see here, now you're in the pre-Pontian cistern, but the surgeons, uh, we are now, we're very uh, much acknowledging that this is not a good ETV because we are not intraarachnoidal. We still are within, uh, between the arachnoid and the and the dura, and it's a uh, key for us now to uh, to do the uh, intraarachnoidal opening <clears throat> by making cuts uh, carefully now here into the arachnoid and making sure that we are intra-arachnoidal before we go back into the ventricle. Here you can see, make an opening into the arachnoid to make sure we can see some of the cranial nerves, the perforators of the basilar. Uh, the, there are two types of uh, flexible uh, endoscope. There's the fiber optic, the video I showed you earlier from Uganda, and there's the digital video uh, uh, flexor endoscope. I have to be careful and say that this is not available worldwide. For instance, in Europe, where actually the flexor endoscope is made by stores, it's still not approved in for sale in Europe because of European uh, uh, restrictions and, and certification, and, but they're working on it. So in North America and Africa, some parts of South America and in Asia, you can get the flexor endoscopes, but others, they are still not available. The truth is this is very similar flexor endoscope used by, by pulmonologists actually for bronchoscopy. And uh, the major difference is that the optics or the picture with the digital uh, 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 video uh, flexor endoscope are better. But the downside is that the tip of the digital flexor endoscope has uh, uh, a, a microchip, and if you do too much of thermocoagulation with the cautery close to microchip, the circuit will break and the screen will go black. So you have to maintain a, a distance between the microchip at the tip of the of this digital flexor endoscope and the monopolar cautery. So those are uh, videos from my current practice. Uh, you can see better pictures with the video endoscope, uh, but you have to keep the tip away from the uh, uh, from the monopolar cautery. This is one of the early videos. I'm working very slow. I do uh, on and off irrigation to avoid overheating of the CSF. And the goal is to maximize the CPC and then get into the temporal horns. Another video also with the uh, digital endoscope, uh, uh, carefully doing a coagulation of the vessels, the choroidal vessels, keeping the uh, uh, 
uh, glomus, uh, and this what can make actually the risk of bleeding less. And now you can see here maximizing the CPC and keep working then to curve the tip of the endoscope uh, to get into uh, the temporal horn and maximize the CPC. The goal typically is to get anywhere between 90 to 95% CPC. Now we're on the temporal horn and getting the uh, careful um, uh, coagulation of this portion, which otherwise would not be able to get it with the rigid endoscope. Again, the ST trial is ongoing. 16 centers in North America are enrolling patients. All indications for hydrocephalus are included except post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, and they expanded the age for enrollment up to two years. All patients obviously have to meet certain criteria clinically and radiographically. We follow the patients up to five years with um, neuropsychological testing, DTI tractography, and uh, CSF biomarkers. Here in Orlando, when I do ETV CPC, which is common, always, almost always do them in lateral position. Here I'm marking the right corner of the interior uh, fontanel, and I'm preparing a curvilinear incision at the corner over the corner of the right fontanel, uh, excuse me, the right corner of the interior fontanel, and I'm ready to use the same incision to place a shunt if the ETB fails. The setup, again, similar to Uganda, it doesn't matter if it's digital or fiber optic endoscope, the holding arms essential to help you perform the surgery safely. This is a surgery, this is a baby we did a few months ago with NeuroKids in Amman, uh, Jordan, uh, again, the same technique uh, used. How about for other indications? For instance, for spina bifida. We all know that uh, historically, spina bifida or myeloma lingocele was considered a risk factor for ETV failure. The literature is uh, goes back and forth about uh, being controversial about who's supporting it and who's not. We know from the ETV success score that myeloma lingocele is considered a risk factor for ETV uh, failure. But we know from the WARF data from Uganda that for myeloma lingocele cases, that data show ETV CPC appears to uh, show, again, durable, uh, more durable primary treatment of hydrocephalus than shunt. Question is, should we try it for everyone? My personal opinion, the answer is no. You, we need to always look at favorable anatomy. If you look at the left side, this baby, or this child has hydrocephalus and spam bifida. Is this a good case for ETV or ETV CPC? I don't think so, or if they have a syrinx or a big one. On the other one, the one on the right side, also has spina bifida. And uh, you can see here, three years later, the ETV remains patent. Uh, studies from France, large series, showed approximately ETV uh, CPC has a success rate for spina bifida patients around 70%. The MOMS trial, uh, the management of myeloma legacy study, looking at fetal in uterine treatment of hydrocephalus showing that if we treat the spina bifida under uh, 26 weeks of gestation, this can cut the rates of shunting from 80 down to 40%. But the MOMS trial never looked at ETV, and that's what we did after the MOMS trial. So the take-home message from MOMS trial was we can reduce the rates of shunting, we can improve motor and cognitive outcomes after fetal surgery for spina bifida, at the risk, obviously, of prematurity in up to 13% of cases at risk of maternal complications. But nobody talked about in the MOMS trial about how about ETV uh, for those patients if they have favorable anatomy. A follow-up study by late Professor Tulipan in 2016 showed actually that fetal surgery actually did not matter when it comes to hydrocephalus shunting rates if the pre-fetal surgery ventricular size reached the severe hydrocephalus in fetuses, which is around 15 millimeters or more. Uh, we started a program over uh, uh, 10 years ago in St. Louis, and now we have a program in Orlando. Uh, the person experiences over 100 cases. Uh, I'm not here to talk about fetal surgery, but briefly we'll talk about that after performing fetal and uterine surgery to repair the Effects in utero uh, between 22 and 26 weeks and performing uh, after tubularization of the plaque code and closing the dura and closing the skin. All that's done before 26 weeks. It's important to get watertight closure to help with 
<clears throat> stopping the fistula of CSF leak and eventually reversing the hindbrained herniation and eventually improve the rates of shunting. But in my mind, that's not enough. How about ETV? If, if I'm improving the Chiari malformation, this can also improve my chances for ETV outcomes if we try for this patient population, although it was never tried in the mom's trial. So for instance, here on the left side, this is a fetal MRI showing uh, severe Chiari and spina bifida, and this is after fetus surgery. You can see the reversal of the cerebellar tonsils in the fetus and the CSF surrounding the placard. And uh, we have question is, should we try for every patient? For instance, in this case, uh, had fetus surgery, had partial reversal of the hindbrain herniation. Uh, those patients typically present late, usually around four to eight months of age if they have fetus surgery. And the anatomy of the third ventricle, many of them is actually near normal. It's amazing how the anatomy is reversed after fetus surgery. Like in this case, had fetus surgery, uh, partial reversal of the Chiari. We did the ETV. There are two membranes. Uh, the Liliquist membrane was there. Now I'm happy with the ETV. And we can see those cases can correct. Actually, the ventricles can come down if we wait long enough uh, for two years. And years later, if we follow them carefully, developmentally, and neurocognitively, we can have patent ETVs, but we need to follow them uh, long term. Uh, the in spine bifida population, we have to be careful about the uh, floor of third ventricle. You can see here the patients can have thick uh, ma massa intermedia or thick uh, intraarachnoidal, excuse me, interthalamic adhesions. But this did not actually stop us from trying in every case. Here are some three patients. All of them have spine bifida. You can see different anatomical variations for the floor third ventricle. But we, if we don't try, we will never know. But we should have a low threshold to bail out if we do not feel the anatomy is safe. All those patients have spina bifida. This is a normal floor in spina bifida. This one, the stoma is anterior to the interthalamic uh, adhesions. And the goal is to get to pre cistern and feel confident about the communication with the intraarachnoidal space. This is a posterior stoma to the interthalamic adhesions, and this is also posterior stoma as well. We should have a low threshold to convert an ETV to a shunt. In my practice, I have four indications to, uh, to go for a shunt. Uh, if I do ETV, the mother is happy, but there's progressive macrocrania, or there are ongoing or new developmental or neurocognitive delays in Bailey's testing. Uh, Bailey's testing is trusted as young as six months of age. If you have a good neuropsychologist you work with and you trust, obviously if there's increased ventricular size or if there's a new searing or uh, progression of previously diagnosed searing. Those four indications for me will make me just go for a shunt. Parents will tell me, no, the ETV is working, my child is doing well, and I say, no, we are, uh, I don't care about how you and I feel about the ETV today or ETV CPC. What I care about when your child is six years old, going to first grade at school, does this child have the best neurocognitive outcome to carry on with his or her peers at the school? And that what matters at the end. From our data, looking at uh, ETV and ETV CPC outcomes for spine bifida population, after fetus surgery, we know the mom's trial talked about shunting rate 40%. In St. Louis, we're at 27%. Now we're around 25%. And I do believe the numbers are lower, uh, but because we are in, we are an enrollment site for the ST trial, we are uh, uh, randomizing some babies for shunts, so our ETV numbers are lower. We publish our data looking at ETV and ETV CPC outcomes specifically for this patient population that had fetal surgery uh, previously, and we hope uh, our numbers now from the ST trial will show uh, um, continued improved outcomes. When we looked carefully in our data looking at ETV and ETV CPC outcomes for the fetal surgery spinal for the population, actually the ventricular size prior to fetal surgery again showed similar results to what Professor Tolopan's paper showed. 
that if the babies or the fetuses prior to fetus surgery reach the 15 millimeter mark, this patient is going to end up with a shunt regardless. Two recent uh, meta-analysis came out. This is those are important papers came out. One of them last year in JNS showing that when they looked meta-analysis looking at ETV CPC for spina bifida, they found that ETV alone success rate is around uh, 48 to 50%, and with ETV CPC around 75%. If I compare those numbers to our current practice, the numbers are actually comparable. Uh, uh, that the success rate uh, for ETV CPC is around 70, 75%. And another uh, meta analysis, system another systematic review of meta analysis came out also last year. Look carefully at risk factors for failure. This is actually a very interesting meta analysis. It showed that when they looked at risk factors for failure, there was a geographic difference when it comes to ETV CPC failure rates. How can we explain that? I looked carefully, read through the paper, and they explain it that obviously in this meta-analysis, they include large number of papers from Eastern and Sub-Saharan Africa from the Benjamin Wharf experience. And in general, those patients, when they presented for ETV CPC, they were older. And the etiology was post-infectious hydrocephalus um, more than spina bifida. So the risk factor for ETV CPC failure was lower in that patient population compared to North America, where they something them all together. And those are probably the only two explanations why there's a geographic uh, a difference between ETV CPC uh, risk factors for failure. Uh, should we try it for every myeloma malignancy patient? The answer is no. This is a reasonable case to spina bifida to try ETV, this one is not. The parents will come to me trying to twist my arm to try ETV or ETV CPC, and they say, if this is my child, I'll go straight to a shunt. Uh, the, the potential to expand this worldwide is tremendous. Uh, but here's a picture of Professor Ben Worf in the early 2000s in, in Uganda. Uh, I personally consider him a mentor, taught us a lot, continue to learn from him. But in the last two years, there's a tremendous effort globally happening under the direction of NeuroKids and this amazing group of uh, uh, colleagues and friends from uh, working with Professor Worf, uh, expanding the work or the teaching for ETV CPC outside of just Uganda. Here are some pictures in Rabat, Morocco, uh, here from Mombasa, Kenya, here from Amman, Jordan. I had the honor to help with training the team there. Uh, I think the future is uh, is really bright for expanding this technique worldwide. And and the jury is still out. We hope the ST trial in the next three to five years will show us uh, uh, long-term outcomes that we can uh, trust. Uh, sorry about that. So... I think here's, in conclusion, uh, ETV CPC is a, is a very reasonable alternative treatment option for hydrocephalus after we consider age, etiology, status of the uh, foramen magnum or fourth ventricular obstruction, as well as the parental acceptance for ETV. Fetus surgery can change things when it comes to ETV outcomes, especially if we add CPC. We hope to see a uh, an updated ETV success score that gives a credit to a prenatal surgery for spina bifida. And we hope the ST trial results coming out in the next three years will give us the final result that would be promising. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Sama. That was a fantastic talk, uh, um, going through all the nuances uh, and as well as the important uh, controversies. Uh, George, can I Thank please you. ask you to uh, make your comments and the questions, uh, please. Absolutely, Sam, that was an incredible talk. I mean, just a thorough review of uh, ETV CPC as well as, uh, you know, malamnegocele repair. Um, one question. So when you do um, your uh, ETVs for your seals, do you do a CPC or do you just do the ETV alone? So it all, thank you, Professor Jallo. It all depends on 
the age, obviously. Uh, now I'm a little bit biased in my answer because as an enrollment center for the ST trial, I have to be uh, fair and, and follow the indications. And if a patient uh, meets all the criteria, I'm obligated uh, morally and ethically to, to offer the trial to them. Uh, so if, the, if a patient is not part of the ST trial or being randomized, I look at the anatomy, I talk to the parents, and I, if they dis, and I look at the age as well. Occasionally, I get patients come to me for second opinion who are two years of age, who had a untreated hydrocephalus, and they see, I see a good anatomy for ETV. I do not add the CPC. As we speak today, in 20, about to be 2024, there's no evidence that performing CPC over the age of 12 months has any scientific basis. So if they're under the age of one, I almost always add CPC. Uh, uh, between the ages of one and two, uh, now the trial will, as those babies are included in the trial, but if patients are not part of the trial, I do not do CPC over the age of one. Otherwise I do it in every case. That was very helpful, Samer. I mean, just because I mean, in your, in, it looks like your results, your ETV success rate is equivalent to the ETV plus the CPC in the meta-analysis. Uh, that that is that the there was one meta-analysis that showed the ETV CPC success rate uh, is around seventy percent. Without it, is around fifty percent. When I talk to parents, I always tell them that CPC adds approximately 10 to 20% of success to the ETV success score. This is near accurate, and this is, has been discussed by many colleagues, but it is fair to uh, add statistically when we talk to families around 10 to 20% of C increased success rate when we add the CPC. Are you on mute, George? Oh, hey, Simon, that was excellent e explanation. Thank you for sharing with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shalindra, do you want? Uh, great, great talk. I, 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 I have a, a dream of going to the cure with COVID. They had called me to work there, but I, I just couldn't be bothered to fill the form <laughs> registration and stuff like that. So. Hopefully, I'll do it this year. That will be my new year resolution to go there because I've been work, working in Africa and I've been to a few missions with Mercy Ships and done a lot of craniofacial encephalocele work. So I would be really interested to see whether I can um, see what they're doing and probably try to implement some of them in my in my work in Africa. Uh, great talk. I, I would love to do that. The question is, when you, when you, when you coagulate the CPC, the the basically you are basically causing an inflammation and killing the coronal plexus. So my question is, do they get chemical meningitis? How do you explain postoperatively? Do you have scans to show that the coronal plexus is completely gone or you still see coronal plexus? And what about the coronal plexus present in the fourth ventricle and the spinal central canal you're talking about? Thank you. Uh, the goal is to keep the baby safe. And the goal is to partially cut down the production of CSF and to reach what is uh, anatomically feasible and safely feasible uh, choroplex that we can cauterize. The importance is to stay away from the ependema, to stay away from the choroidal vessels as they feed into the thalamus or the ependema, and to stay focused on the bulk of the choroplexus and if it doesn't look safe, don't try it. Uh, if, if I look at a parkour plexus and a vessel feeding it, and it could be feeding the thalamus or could be, uh, the answer is no, don't touch it. And I stay away from it. Uh, the, my ex personal experience is very similar to what was published by the group in Miami and other places that if you do ETVC, if you're planning to do CPC, unless you do 85% or more, the the outcomes will will not make a difference. So trying, I always put in my operative note, I did eighty five or I did ninety or I did ninety five. Uh, we don't go to the third ventricle choroplexus. We don't go to the fourth ventricle. Only the lateral ventricles 
the frontal horn without obviously injuring the thalamus striator, septal veins of the frame of Monroe, follow the atrium, follow, go into the glomus, and follow it into the temporal horn and keep the ependema safe. I have not seen chemical meningitis, although uh, my, in my personal experience, we have approximately one out of five babies uh, can have brief seizures postoperatively. And this was published actually that uh, not only CPC, even in ETVs alone, there is a, from the pneumocephalus itself, even without the heating, the CSF, you have a risk of seizure. So we do seizure prophylaxis typically for the hospital stay for our babies. Uh, we do on and off irrigation. I have not seen any patients who has classic chemical meningitis. I've seen some who have uh, brief seizures in the first 24 hours. And those typically are the babies, when I looked at the imaging in retrospect, they had significant pneumocephalus postoperatively. And I personally, in my practice, have never seen a child from seizures from ETV CPC have long term epilepsy. Uh, usually it's brief. Postoperatively, if you do an MRI, do you see a bit of coronary plexus? Does it regenerate? And the other question is have you tried the bipolar to coagulate the coronary plexus? Because there is bipolars are available to do that. So instead of monopolar, have you tried the bipolar? Thank you. So the, the truth is, we are limited by the available technology. The current flexible endoscopes on the market uh, uh, have a very, very tiny working channel. And the working channel fits one thing, either the monopolar or irrigation or the balloon. You cannot do two actually at the same time. You cannot do monopolar and irrigation at the same time uh, because if we are limited by the uh, sub-millimeter working channel uh, of the uh, of the flexor endoscope. Thank you. And what about the and MRI findings? MRIs typically we do fast sequence or flash T2 MRI the day after surgery in old babies. You you can tell that if they had preoperatively severe hydrocephalus and dangling choroid plexus, bulky glomus in the in the atrium or occipital horn of the ventricle, you'll see it thinner. Uh, I can tell you, uh, I don't I didn't have time to show a few videos. I went back, so before Uganda, I did a bunch of ETV CPCs with the rigid endoscope, and I left, obviously, the temporal horns anatomically. I went, Some of them came back three, four years later with ETV failure, and I decided, you know what, before putting a shunt, should we do the ETV again? So I went in, but this time I went with the flexible endoscope, and I could see in every case where I failed with the rigid endoscope to, to cauterize. And, and the success rate with a redo ETV in this population is around 50%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Professor Keller. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. I just want to ask you, is the amount of uh, coagulated plexus um, directly related to the success rate of the hydrocephalus? Uh, thank you. Uh, multiple, uh, lit many, lit many papers, all of them showed uh, that the targeted percentage of visualized choroid plexus cauterized should be between 85 and 90% to make a difference. So, in all my cases, I always target 90 to 95%. And it's a, there, it's a, the learning curve is steep. Uh, when I started doing ETV CPC, I can tell you my success rate was lower because I was not good at maximizing the, uh, the uh, CPC. So uh, the, nowadays, the operative time is shorter, uh, less complications, quicker hospital stay, and on eventful hospital stay, most of them, and uh, maximized CPC and higher success rates. Well, um, there are some some papers, uh, I think they are from Croatia, they were just looking for the role of choroid plexus and also circulation and where CSF is produced. And uh, they have found that uh, the choroid plexus in dogs, it was adult dogs, 
they have no substantial role in the uh, CSF production. Maybe it's different in uh, kids and children or, and adults. I'm not really sure. They just say they don't even know the role of choroid plexus. Uh, they say they are, assume that there might be uh, uh, or it takes part of the immune system. Uh, so it's it's quite very interesting. And uh, I just uh, want to know your opinion for that. Yeah, obviously, when I started doing CPC, I had the same concerns. I went back, started reading uh, neurophysiology textbooks, looking at the actual role of choroid plexus. And I found uh, there's enough data to talk about choroid plexus is not about CSF. It's also about brain protection and, and development uh, so when the ST trial came out, or I became one of the first people, I said, I would love to participate because I want to know the answer. Does the ETV CPC have any impact in a positive or negative way on neurocognitive outcomes? And I can tell you, everything we have in the literature right now is retrospective. And this would be this is an ongoing prospective randomized trial. We, we should have the results in the next two, three years, and we will have the uh, correct, accurate or correct answer. And this answer may change how we practice. We either all of us start doing more ETV-CPC or it's going to plummet and we stop doing it altogether. And we have to accept the results as they come. Uh, but it's truly this trial or this study focus on, on neurocognitive outcomes not only that, looking at deeper understanding of the brain anatomy after ETV, CBC, comparing them to shunts, all of them get at one, three, and five year DTI tractography, looking at the white matter tracts, the impact of the expansion of the uh, ventricles on the white matter tracts, and combining the deep anatomical uh, anatomy of the brain, at least radiographically, and combining it with neurocognitive outcomes we should have the answer if what we're doing for the choroid plexus is good or bad. And what we read in the neurophysiology textbooks about the impact of choroid plexus and brain protection and development, are we impacting it in a negative way or not? And we will know the answer at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I go to Dr. Elias Risk, um, Professor Kala uh, and uh, Samer, do you see uh, a role for CPC uh, for normal pressure hydrocephalus? Obviously, if correlation study is right, it's not. But, Prof, do you have any thoughts? Well, um, there were in former times some some studies, uh, I think, from Bristol. Um, but uh, those results, at least as I know, it, uh, were not reproducible by others. Um, and uh, so we we have good treatment. It would be really uh, uh, so if you if you introduce a new treatment for adults for NPH, um, uh, it's very difficult uh, to do it if you have already good treatment to do it. Uh, a more experimental treatment, you will have a lot of problems with the ethical uh, commissions. And uh, um, also because we don't really understand, as I said before, and we just heard, we don't even know exactly the role of uh, the choroid plexus. And especially in elderly, maybe there is a difference also in the young and the old um, uh, choroid plexus. I think it will be very difficult to perform such a uh, study. and uh, uh, But it would be, of course, very interesting, but there has to be first animal studies before we can do this in patients. Thanks. Thank you. Samar, how hard is it to do a CPC in a patient with a normal pressure hydrocephalus with a large ventricle? Is it straightforward? It should be straightforward. Uh, we all know that the bigger the ventricles, the safer the CPC surgery. And uh, the question is if it works or not. As I mentioned earlier, 
as we speak today, there is no scientific evidence that CPC actually uh, makes a difference over the age of 12 months of age. So to add uh, to ETV for adults with MPH, uh, does it make a difference or not? We need a large study to, to know the answer. I do believe anatomically it's safe and easy and quick to perform. Uh, question if it will make a difference. Thanks. The other question is that when you do CPC, obviously you are releasing a lot of debris and a lot of proteins. And do you wash out for a long time before you come out? Or what's the risk of causing communicating hydrocephalus after, uh, worsening the hydrocephalus after the CPC if you are doing a lot of uh, Excellent question. This, as I mentioned earlier, this is a learning curve. In the first, I would say, 10 CPC cases I did, I had, I caused one intraventricular hemorrhage that I spent another hour irrigating out. In one case, uh, I was not happy. I left an EVD for a few days. And obviously, all those patients, I didn't serve them well. I ended up shunting them later. But later on, as the experience uh, became uh, got better and the operative time is shorter and the CPC is maximized in a short period of time, uh, in those patients, the the uh, the the outcomes are better. So, it it there's a learning curve there, and and the quicker you do it uh, with maximized CPC and trusted ETV that you can trust at the end of the case, I I do believe we should try it for the right indications. Thanks. There's a question from Dr. Jarad Nugusi uh, on the chat box. Uh, my understanding is that you do the CPC just in the in the lateral ventricles. Is that right? You don't. That's that's what you mentioned, and you don't go around uh, into any other ventricle because it's not going to be possible, is it? Yes, only the lateral ventricles. Obviously, if the septum pollicidum is intact, we have to do septostomy. That's great. Thanks, Doctor Elias Risk. Please thanks. Thank you, Samer, for this wonderful overview. Um, you mean Thank lots you. of questions remain to be answered, and you know, hopefully, the trial will give us some answers. But you know, you never hear that I went in in the reverse and did the CPC and added the ETV just to be safe, or to add with the treatment of hydrocephalus. And uh, you know, to, to imagine the whole choroid plexus as a producer of CSF, and then he did those. Um, surgical interventions to try to treat the hydrocephalus where he excised the whole choroid plexus in patients and uh, really failed at the treatment of hydrocephalus in that, in that manner raises the question, is this small organ able or capable of producing half a liter of CSF a day and circulate in such a high amount? And what happens after the fact with all the inflammatory uh, processes that develop in the next weeks? So, you know, still, still the jury is out there and why does it only work for less than one? And this data is coming from hydrocephalus in Uganda with a completely different etiology of hydrocephalus than the rest of the world. <clears throat> you know, you can't really uh, uh, recommend it as a universal answer, but sometimes uh, small differences can make a difference, like you said, with the percentage of choroid plexus tackled, and that might um, show some benefit. So, you know, our, our tools to figure out successes also are very poor. So we really need to do a better job, us as neurosurgeons, to understand this better. And hopefully the new trials coming out can discern that uh, true truth from facts, uh, truth from uh, fiction. Yes, thank you, Elias. I agree. And to go back to Noreen's question, uh, at the end of the case, before closing, I spend around three minutes doing gentle irrigation to make sure no inflammatory markers. Uh, if there are any drops of blood here or there to irrigate them out. Thanks. And the other question is that, once again, the same as if it were for the uh, lavage. In, in terms of maneuvering your endoscope, are you causing any traction injury to the brain um, that would be of significance? Any two or three? Great question. So this is the beauty of the flexible endoscope, that it's bimanual. You're holding the endoscope in one hand, and with the other hand, you're doing the adjustment of the head. 
So the amount of attraction in the on the uh, uh, tracked through the white matter is is minimal. And again, it's operator dependent. Uh, I started um, when I was in in Uganda. I trained to use the uh, flexible endoscope without um, an, a sheath uh, and just puncturing through the parenchyma. And the right now in my practice, I use the uh, the small size um, uh, sheath from Escolap. I use it so I can pass the the flexible uh, endoscope from stores through it. In my opinion, it, it limits the amount of traction and it keeps the tract very clean and avoids any blood product from seeping around the tract. And it takes only one drop of blood in the CSF to make the picture of the flexible endoscope look look uh, not user-friendly. And this adds around five minutes of irrigation and just adds to the operative time. The goal is to go in and out, get the work done safely and effectively, and cutting down the operative time is critical. That's brilliant. So thank you very much, um, Dr. El Baba. I think we have had a fantastic uh, webinar. Uh, I think uh, our format of uh, open questions, I think it's, you know, sometimes I go to conferences, some some people don't get any questions, and when it's an interesting, interesting presentation, you can't ask enough questions. And I um, know uh, this was always meant to be a, a webinar where, where that you know uh, we we have uh, we actually um, learn and we tease things out, and, um, and this is the festive period time. But I really am very grateful uh, to Dr. Elias Risk, Dr. George Allo. Uh, Dr. Shalindra Magdum, and Dr. Professor uh, Uwe Kohler and Sama. This has been a fantastic uh, um, webinar. I hope you found it rewarding, uh, both faculty as well as the delegates. And um, uh, any, anything, George? Um, gosh, you, George, you want to... Naren, thank you again for hosting uh, this uh, webinar. As you said, I mean... Just the lectures were all phenomenal and the participation was incredible. I, I mean, you know, I learned a lot today. So uh, I'm always grateful uh, uh, to when I participate, uh, besides just giving my lecture, that I'm also uh, learning from the other speakers as we did uh, th this morning or this afternoon. So thank you for hosting us. Thanks, Professor Kola. It's a slightly different format from other webinars, but I hope. You found it interesting. In the I uh, first of all, I want to thank you to uh, to do this uh, format, and uh, it was really fantastic. I I really learned a lot today, and uh, it's uh, and you're you're right. It's uh, so often a problem that we have we we come to very interesting things, and we don't have any time to discuss it. And uh, so I enjoyed this very much that we could really discuss it to the end. Uh, also, it was a, it took a lot of time, but it was good invested time, I would say, because uh, we really and I learned quite a lot. It was very nice for me also to to hear some uh, some uh, nice things from the pediatric neurosurgery and pediatric hydrocephalus, which is very worthwhile. And uh, very often, you learn something from the others. Are, and it's so important to to hear what the others do, and uh, I thank everybody. And uh, it was very nice. And uh, I want to wish now everybody a successful, healthy, uh, happy 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Kula. Really grateful, uh, Mr. Sharin Tomagdu. You are just uh, the same sentiments echoed by everybody else. It's just uh, exchange of ideas and learning from everyone else. Uh, uh, I just feel like um, I've been enriched uh, spending a Sunday, a Saturday afternoon, and uh, it's lovely to meet you all in person. I've met you at conferences, but uh, as you know, you just stand up two minutes, 30 seconds, question and answers, which hardly get heard by anyone, and just you walk away. And then by the time you catch up the person, it's a time for him to go away somewhere else. So I love these kind of seminars. and. Uh, and I uh, know I met uh, George about uh, in 2001 or somewhere in Croatia on a on a ship when we were going for a European conference, and I still remember uh, the day that uh, we met. Uh, so it's like <laughs> meeting the friends back again after many years, bit grayer and bolder. <laughs>
Elias, I know it's a bit early there. Yeah, thank you very much, Nana, for putting all this together. Wonderful cohort of fantastic um, individuals and scientific uh, discussion of hydrocephalus. Um, obviously, dear and near to my heart and everybody else's heart. And thank you so much for putting all this wonderful scientific endeavor together. Thanks, Lordly. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Sama, thanks for uh, short notice. I appreciate it. Short notice. I'm afraid at the moment I can't schedule things in long term. But Sam, thanks for the short notice. But please, your thoughts. Uh, I hope you found it rewarding. And uh, Noreen, as always, you are a leader in uh, bringing us together, uh, not only to teach, but to learn from each other. I truly enjoyed so much today this uh, webinar with colleagues and participants. I enjoyed the questions and the discussion. And uh, there's no question I would be serving my patients with hydrocephalus better start next week after the holiday. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm going to give the last words to Dr. Butt. Dr. Butt, as always, Dr. Butt is always, as well as uh, um, Nicholas. Thank you. Dr. Butt. Thank you very much, Naren. I have thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, it is a testimony of your uh, vision and popularity that you could get such an illustrious faculty. And uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed the presentations, but more importantly, as you rightly said, the discussions and uh, like Professor Albaba said, we will definitely make better patient care from the e new year. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Bhatt. So thank you very much to all the participants for taking time out as well. And I see a couple of friends, Constantin and Angela. Thanks for joining and wishing you a very happy 2024. Bless you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Take care. Enjoy the time with your families. Bye. I will send you the link for the recording so you can always go. Thanks a lot. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you.